Good morning and welcome to the Gairdner International Symposium in this Gairdner Science Week. The future of AI in science and medicine, obviously a very important and hot topic for us all to consider. I'm Janet Rossand and I'm President and Scientific Director of the Gairdner Foundation, a great job. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that Mars is located in Toronto on the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, the Anishinaabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. This territory is subject to the Dish of One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant, an agreement to peaceably share and, and care for the Great Lakes region. As I said, this event is part of Gairdner Science Week, which is an annual week-long celebration of our Gairdner Award laureates who are all gathering here in Toronto today uh, and to really to discuss and celebrate the impact of their research on human health. I'd like to thank our long-term partners, the Government of Canada through CIHR, the Government of Quebec, and the Government of Alberta. And a special thank to all our Gairdner Science Week sponsors who are on this slide, who really made these events possible. Our platinum sponsors, the University Health Network, the Kremble Foundation, and Telus Health particularly. Our gold sponsors listed on the slide, University of Toronto, London Drugs, McGill University, Moderna Canada, Women's College Hospital, Sunnybrook Research Institute, CAMH, McMaster, and IDRC. And all our other sponsors and donors and volunteers who've helped make the events here in Toronto, but also across the country, really exciting uh, and successful this week. Without all their support, we wouldn't have this work of network this week of networking, engagement, and education. Today's symposium topic is really inspired by the work of the 2023 Canada Gardner International Award laureates, Dr. Demis Hassabis and John Jumper. And you're going to hear from them and some of the world's top researchers in the field of AI as it relates to science and medicine. And now I'd like to introduce our morning chair, Kate Williams, who is scientific director of the Kremble Foundation, one of our major and long-term sponsors. Kate. Thank you, Janet, and welcome and good morning, everyone. Um, as Janet said, my name is Kate Williams. I'm the scientific director at the Kremble Foundation. Uh, we've had a long-standing partnership with the Gardner Foundation, and we are thrilled to help support this year's international symposium on the future of AI in science and medicine. I think we would be hard-pressed to find any industry that isn't exploring or using AI, and of course, science and medicine are no exception. And I think the attendance here today and online is testament to the excitement and curiosity and interest in this particular area of science and medicine. And I'm personally looking forward to a fascinating session. So we have six speakers here today. We'll have a short break about halfway through. Um, after each talk, we will have about five minutes for questions. I encourage everyone to submit them via the Slido link, which will be up throughout the presentation. And we'll have an opportunity to uh, go through those questions afterwards, time permitting. So without further delay, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Cheryl Aerosmith. Dr. Aerosmith is a senior scientist at the Princess Margaret Cancer Center, professor in the Department of Medical Biophys Biophysics at the University of Toronto, and the chief scientist of the SGC. Her research focuses on the structural and chemical biology of chromatin and epigenetic regulatory factors, especially as it relates to cancer and drug discovery. In partnership with major pharmaceutical companies, she leads the SGC's international open science program that is developing and distributing unencumbered chemical probes that support the discovery of new medicines. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Cheryl Aerosmith to the stage for her talk entitled From AlphaFold to Computational Drug Design, Open Experimental Data to Enable AI in Drug Discovery. Good morning, everyone. Um, I'm very pleased to be here. Thank you to the organizers. And um, it's such a pleasure to share in the celebration of the uh, developers of AlphaFold as a structural biologist. This is a, a revolution in our field and something we've worked for, towards uh, for many, many years. Um, myself on the data generation side, of protein structure side. So um, let's see. Today, uh, I would like to um, build on this uh, wonderful achievement and, and um, look a little bit in the past about some of the factors that um, we think um, helped uh, set up AlphaFold for success 
and also um, how we can learn from that and, and move forward in the future. So uh, as I said, AlphaFold was, uh, was a real um, breakthrough in, in the field. Uh, it's democratized structural biology so that um, most scientists can use it now um, instead of being limited to the, the experimentalists um, uh, like, like ourselves. Um, so we think that the next big challenge in the field, one of the next big challenges, probably as, as uh, um, uh, challenging as, as pro the protein folding problem, is um, being able to predict a small drug-like molecule that will bind to a given protein, um, predicted at will to use for uh, drug discovery uh, and or for tools to, to modulate that protein and understand biology. So how will we get there to be able to do that purely computationally? So um, I will talk about uh, lessons learned from the structural biology community and AlphaFold success, uh, a pilot project that we've uh, undertaken to assess AI-assisted um, uh, protein compound uh, interaction screening methods, a community benchmarking uh, program called CASH that is modeled after the, the program that was used to validate um, uh, protein structure prediction, and then our, our efforts to enable uh, AI methods with open data um, in AI-ready format to um, uh, facilitate the community to, to use AI uh, in the future. So what does success look like? Uh, in the case of AlphaFold, um, it was participation in this um, longstanding 28-year um, uh, program uh, called, uh, called CASP, which every two years would have a competition to assess um, groups that would predict 3D protein structure from a set of 3D structures that were not yet released or revealed to the world. And what you see here is that the AlphaFold 2 in CAS competition number 14, this is a, a measure of success score, and you can see it's miles above the, the other competitors. And so uh, for many years, the, uh, the plot looked somewhat like this, where the, the best groups were a little bit better than the, than the rest, and this is, uh, was really uh, a remarkable breakthrough. So we, um, we participated in that whole field in, in the sense that um, structural genomics groups were um, meant to, uh, our goal was to do high throughput structural biology, not only to understand three uh, protein structures, but some of the structural genomics groups, particularly the one in the US, the Protein Structure Initiative by the NIH, was meant to um, populate the protein database with uh, a variety of 3D protein structures that were each very novel that didn't look like anything else that was already in there. Uh, so the SGC was among the um, largest contributors uh, to the PDB of any one group and the greatest single contributor to the CASP competitions for a number of years. Um, but we then um, turned around um, a bit, little over 10 years ago to using the proteins that we made um, to, in order to solve their structures. We had a, a large um, uh, fridge, if you will, of our freezer of, of uh, recombinant proteins uh, and knew how to make them. And so we started using them in partnership with uh, industry and academic partners to identify what we call chemical probes or um, bioactive uh, chemical tools to study the function of those proteins. And now going forward, what we want to do, we want to ramp up that process, try to make it more uh, efficient uh, using uh, machine learning and AI methods and use a data-driven approach to chemical probe and drug discovery. And we're doing this in partnership with industry and all our, all our data and output is open science, public domain, unencumbered for the world to use. So we would like to, we can't do it all ourselves, but we would like to catalyze the, the community. So what is a chemical probe and why are we working on them? Uh, our definition is a drug-like small molecule that selectively modulates the activity of a specific protein uh, in cells and sometimes even in model organisms. Uh, it's among the most, um, or arguably the most um, useful and impactful uh, research tool um, that one can have. Uh, it's the first step in a drug discovery program and it's um, the counterpart of genetic, uh, genetic knockdown, but you can use it much more um, easily in, a, in, in a, um, at will and in a, uh, in a temporal manner, for example. 
So we've made a lot of chemical probes over the years, over the last 10 years, about 200 of them. Even now, um, industry is starting to donate chemical probes from their internal drug discovery programs. And these are all available to the community. Um, hundreds of thousands, or tens of thousands have been distributed. Um, many, many uh, publications, over 12,000, using these compounds by others uh, in addition to us, and inspiring over 50 clinical trials from the from the understanding of the targets that was generated from those compounds. Nevertheless, if you look at this plot here, which plots um, human proteins uh, ranked at 20 or 1,000 or so, ranked by the number of publications that um, on that gene or protein product, you can see the vast majority of publication in the last, uh, over the last 20 years, in fact, um, since the uh, human genome was sequenced, is, is still focused on a very small proportion of the human genome. Now we know the structures of most of these because of AlphaFold, which is wonderful, but nevertheless, um, not much research is focused on them. Unbiased genomics tells us, though, um, from genome-wide association studies and the OMIM database of the mammalian inherited uh, 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 disease-related proteins, that, um, that most of the proteome is associated with disease in some way. So we believe that if we had a pharmacological modulator to every human protein, that it would be absolutely transformational, and you could probe these, the function of these um, proteins. You could validate whether they are drug targets or not, and it would, uh, it would revolutionize um, the way we perform science and biology, we think. So in order to try to do that, um, we've launched an initiative called Target 2035, whose goal is to find a pharmacological um, modulator for most human proteins by the year 2035. Um, again, it would be transformational. Uh, it would vastly accelerate drug discovery, because that's the first step in, in drug discovery to a, a, a protein target. Uh, and it would fulfill the promise of um, precision medicine. However, um, currently, uh, each chemical probe we estimate and our industry partners estimate that it costs between two to five million dollars to generate, it takes a couple years, and so this is just not feasible with, with current technologies and methods. It requires a massive advance in technology, um, particularly we think uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning, machine learning can, uh, can help with many aspects of this. And it's going to require global collaboration data sharing in particular, and providing um, the data that can help train um, uh, machine learning algorithms. So the challenges in this uh, effort are um, enumerated um, in, in many venues, uh, including commentaries and, and editorials. And I've underlined here the key aspects that, that we also recognize and are trying to address. For example, the um, uh, one needs independent verification of predictions made by computational methods. Um, for in the chemistry sphere, and particularly protein ligand interaction, um, accurate, there, there's a paucity of uh, good data sets out there for, for training of algorithms. And when something's predicted, you know, it needs to be uh, validated experimentally. Uh, and, you know, there's different complementary expertise between industry and academia. Most of drug discovery has taken place in industry so far, and uh, we need to work you know, even more effectively together. So we started a pilot project um, um, about two, almost three years ago, in the middle of a pandemic, to try to um, assess the uh, the value of different um, screening methods for what we call HIT finding. So that's doing a um, either medium throughput screen or, or ultra high throughput screen, going from the from the left to, to the right over here, of methods where you, you take a recombinant protein and you test what small molecule, drug-like small molecules uh, interact with it. And, um, uh, and, and it's a, so it's a variety of methods. I'm going to focus on the two here that use um, AI in some, in some way. DNA encoded library screening, uh, so-called DEL, using machine learning to analyze the output um, to identify compounds that are commercially available that one could purchase because we can't um, test, you know, 
all uh, uh, bil billions of the, of the compounds that are screened in the initial screen. And then a purely computational strategy that um, um, uh, computational uh, chemists and, and AI groups um, and companies can uh, try to predict uh, what's going to bind to a given protein. Okay. And we focus this pilot project on a protein family that's um, understudied, so a uh, large part of the, the dark uh, proteome. Um, it, these are protein-protein interaction domains that bring together large protein complexes like the one in the upper right. You can see these uh, donut-shaped uh, molecules. There's three of them in this complex, actually four of them in this complex, uh, holding it together through protein-protein interactions and also a, a DNA-protein interaction here. Um, we were amongst the first to show that this protein family um, was druggable. These are two targets that are involved in epigenetic uh, regulation, and um, the drug-like compounds bind in the central pocket here and compete with the, the protein that they're normally supposed to interact with. So this is the family that we've been working on, these so-called WDR proteins. It's very large, several hundred proteins, um, very much associated with various diseases, particularly cancer. So the Dell machine learning pilot project that we uh, carried out uh, is shown here, annotated on the phylogenetic tree of the protein family. Um, we cloned several hundred proteins. We purified uh, many of them. We solved um, structures, experimental structures of um, 21 or so of them. Um, they can all be predicted pretty, very accurately by alpha fold at the fold level, but the, um, the details of the side chains that are in the central pocket here um, are, um, uh, it, one needs experimental data to, to, um, to uh, accurately dock small, small molecules to them. And, um, and then we did a DNA encoded library screen uh, on a subset of these. We took 16 WDR proteins, one of them, is WDR5, I showed you on the previous screen that we know is a druggable uh, member of the family. Uh, and then we used two non-WDR proteins just to ensure we weren't biasing this uh, collection too much. Um, the DNA encoded library screen was performed at XCHEM, which is a leader in this uh, field. Machine learning was done by a company called Zebi AI that uses AI to analyze um, uh, the uh, Dell output with uh, participation from uh, scientists at Google. And we, they predicted on the order of uh, 3,000 or so compounds that would bind to um, uh, one of the, the, the 18 uh, protein targets, which we purchased and then tested at the SGC using a number of uh, biophysical assays, uh, p primarily surface plasmon resonance, but uh, a number of other experimental methods. So this was, this was actually quite a bit of work uh, on our part. So what did we find? Um, out of 3,000 compounds, we identified uh, a spread over all these targets. Um, each target had a, su a subset of compounds predicted for it. Um, about a third of them, a third of the targets, we could identify at least one uh, low micromolar, so the dissociation constant of the compound from the protein is in the low micromolar range, which is an okay starting point for a, uh, for a chemical probe program. Um, there were three more that had um, very weak, probably not good enough to start with, but detectable. Um, we saw the 3D structure of several of these uh, experimentally. And so this was, this was encouraging. Um, and um, we think, and, and we only had to assess about 3,000 compounds over uh, 18 proteins, which is much, much smaller amount than the uh, typical high throughput screen, which costs uh, over a million dollars and, um, and takes a long time and a lot of protein and a lot of reagents. We also used purely computational methods. So a company called Atomwise did um, some um, uh, computational predictions for us using their, um, their platform. Uh, their algorithm, and we identified again. Um, now, these are even weaker than the experimental uh, predicted compounds, but they're measurable. Um, and uh, a local company called Cyclica, now part of Recursion, uh, also um, had uh, one success out of three. And even though it's uh, pretty weak, 70 micromolar, we could co-crystallize it and show it's binding in the desired pocket. So these are weak but drug-like um, 
potent, more potent than fragments, which is a uh, common uh, uh, screening methodology um, used in some quarters. Um, and the compounds are progressible. Their medicinal chemists um, say they look okay to try to um, make, you know, convert further into a, a drug. And they're the first in class. They're novel compounds for each protein. So um, this encouraged us to, if I was actually quite surprised because the computational methods in the past um, in the, on the proteins I worked on had really not worked. And so we're, we're, we seem, the, the field had seemed to have made some progress. Uh, but how do you know? As I mentioned in the beginning, how do you know when, you've, um, when, you're, when you're successful? So we thought we needed a competition, a benchmarking competition, similar to the CASP project that I mentioned in the first slide, where um, every, uh, there's regular competitions for um, uh, uh, revealing which, uh, which group um, has made the best predictions. And so my colleague, um, Matthew Shapira, uh, in collaboration with uh, Alan Edwards and also John Malt, who ran the CASP competitions for protein folding, um, uh, have established uh, this, this, this uh, regular uh, competition called CASH for critical assessment of computational hit finding experiments because they all have to be, um, this is a prospective uh, competition where all the predictions have to be uh, confirmed experimentally. So the first competition is almost uh, over with. It's the, the, the data is all over with. The, the results are being analyzed, and they're going to be released in December. The target was a WDR domain from the LARC2 protein, which is a Parkinson's disease target. And the Michael J. Fox Foundation um, funded this, uh, this competition. 35 groups applied to uh, participate. But there's a selection process, uh, and 23 were selected. It was viewed that their approach was, was uh, reasonable. Um, the first round involved 2,000 predicted compounds. Um, each group gets to uh, uh, predict uh, or suggest 100 compounds. Uh, we tested all of them for binding to the LARC2 um, using uh, surface plasma resonance uh, assays. 73 compounds showed weak binding. This information was provided back to the groups that had a successful prediction, and they were given the opportunity to try to improve that, um, uh, the, the strength and the drug-like drug nature of those compounds um, in a second round, because it, a lot of the first round was so weak, it could have been just chance, perhaps. perhaps. If there's progress, progress in the second round, then it suggests that the, the algorithm is really working and, and, um, and progress is being made. Um, four of the five top performing methods um, did use artificial intelligence in their algorithm. And as I said, the data will be released soon. So there's four of these challenges running right now. Um, and they're going to generate a lot of data because we have to, all the predictions we have to um, confirm experimentally. And most of the compounds do not bind, right? So there's a lot of negative data and some positive data. Um, in addition, Okay, and these are systematic, self-consistent data sets that can be um, uh, compared across, uh, across um, consistently amongst one another. We're also um, ramping up our Dell screening platform in uh, collaboration with XChem and HitGen, two companies that are working with us on that, and uh, an affinity selection mass spectrometry uh, uh, platform that will also create a lot of experimental data, both positive and negative, of compounds that bind to proteins. Uh, and we're hoping that this will um, provide some of the uh, open, accessible data that the AI community needs to develop their, their algorithms. So um, where do we put this data? How do we make it available to everyone? Um, Benjamin Head Keynes from um, Princess Margaret University Health Network in University of Toronto uh, is uh, this is his space of, of data science data how do you uh, access and store and disseminate um, good quality data so he's helping us put together its uh, database called AirCheck Artificial Intelligence Ready Chemical Knowledge Base so it's going to have terabytes of data uh, in it uh, hosted on cloud um, servers available with no restriction. Um, we want to have a low barrier to access, and um, the data will be formatted specifically for data scientists to, um, to develop their algorithms. And we encourage them at the same time to make their, their um, 
machine learning models uh, public uh, so that the whole community can learn over time. So our vision for the future is that um, chemical probe discovery and drug discovery uh, can be uh, transitioned from a, uh, from a largely empirical and experimental exercise, which is costly, slow, uh, and, um, and not always successful, to a more computationally and data-driven method um, using AI. Uh, we think that AI is the, is the method that's really going to help uh, transform this. And so the, you know, the typical pipeline for drug discovery goes uh, like this. You identify your targets. You, um, you identify a small molecule that binds uh, to your protein of interest to start with. And um, we think that this is a key area and the area we're focusing on that can, that can really advance this um, to a, a faster, less expensive, uh, and more ro robust method. But then, of course, this is just the beginning of drug discovery. You have to develop that molecule into um, a non-toxic, uh, specific, um, bioactive compound that's going to modulate the disease of interest. And, um, and that takes a lot of uh, medicinal chemistry and an iterative project process uh, going from new compounds synthesized to bio uh, biological assays and back to analyzing the data in a cyclical manner. And we're working with uh, the Acceleration Consortium here at the University of Toronto, who um, are developing the, these, uh, these uh, methods to, um, to facilitate this process using automation and AI uh, and other methodologies. These are so-called self-driving labs. And the goal is to make um, public domain chemical probes for everyone to use. The learnings from this process are going to be useful for anyone doing drug discovery, uh, and then we hope we can now democratize, uh, if you will, the, the process of drug discovery. Um, companies can, um, of course, make drugs better. Maybe this will lower the cost of making a new drug, discovering a new drug. If we know more about the biology, uh, maybe they will fail less often in the clinic, and, and perhaps the cost of drugs will also go down. So I want to acknowledge um, all the wonderful scientists at the SGC and our partners and our collaborators. Too many uh, to mention in, in one slide, but this is the wonderful group at the SGC Toronto uh, currently that I work with. And for the projects that I talked about today, I want to acknowledge um, in particular Mathieu Shapira, who leads the CASH program. Uh, and Alan Edwards, who uh, is the inspiration uh, for many of these ideas, um, all the funders and our um, advisors um, from various uh, universities and, and companies who help us. Thank you very much. Happy to answer a question. So we do have time for a few questions. Um, they are rolling in. I encourage anyone in the audience to submit them. Um, we have uh, five or six minutes here. Uh, just to get this started, so how do you prioritize protein targets in Target 2035? Um, it's a mixture of the individual interest of the scientists participating in it. Target 2035 is a global effort. Anybody who has a target of interest, we hope would, you know, sort of join the effort um, and, and, and partner with us to maybe do, we help do an assay, et cetera. So the, the target choice um, will, will be related to the biology and or the disease of the person uh, or the group of interest. So for example, Michael J. Fox uh, funded the, um, the, the, tar the, the first cask cash competition because that target was a very important um, uh, Parkinson's disease uh, target. Um, we think this is a way for um, groups working in rare disease, for example, where there isn't a lot of resources to bring uh, on a given target or a disease to, um, to join in this collaborative effort and, and get research done on their target and maybe even a, a starting point for a drug discovery program. So it varies, is the answer. <laughs> um, I guess on a similar line of questioning, how are the cash challenges determined? Um, we have a, um, we have a, a, 
advisory group that's made up of people from the pharmaceutical industry and also academics working in the field. And there's a, um, a, a team that evaluates the results in the, um, uh, it evaluates the results and says, yes, that's a, that's a good molecule. The data support that this is a good prediction. And then there's also a committee that decides what the challenge should be. So each challenge is a little bit different. The first one, the LARC2, there was already a 3D structure. There was no known compounds that bound to it. Uh, the next one is um, the SARS-CoV-2 um, uh, RNA helicase, where there are um, small molecule fragments that are known to bind to that protein and a crystal structure, but no uh, drug-like molecules. And so, um, and the next one, there, and then there's two more. And so the, the, each one is a slightly different challenge in the, in the drug discovery uh, process. Yeah. Um, can you elaborate on how you engage pharmaceutical companies and incentivize open science at the same time? Right, right. So we're a pre-competitive consortium. So we work in areas where um, the problem is too large for any one organization to solve the problem themselves. So in the beginning in structural biology, the human genome had been sequenced and you know, all the pharma companies were thinking, all uh, the structural biologists were thinking, oh my gosh, we have to, we have to solve all these new drug targets. Um, so the concept, that's how the SGC was founded, pool, the, pool resources together and um, solve all these new structures and make them uh, public. Uh, then when we started doing chemical probes, similarly work in areas of, um, Here's an interesting target. Maybe it's not mission critical to our company, but we're interested in it. Let's work with the SGC and make a chemical probe and see if it really is a good drug, drug target by using the, the chemical probe to test it in disease models. Uh, we have a couple more minutes, so I'll keep going as long as the questions come in. <laughs> uh, this one is a bit more specific. LB, WDR is a very large family. How do you deal with target specificity at the R&D commercialization levels which ones to select, which ones to invest? Um, the WDR is a very large family, uh, 350 or so proteins. They all look the same, like a donut, um, at the fold level, but the middle of the donut, which is the, the canonical binding site, is not conserved. Every one of them is different. So it's not like a kinase where you have um, similar, um, a similar binding site that, that causes trouble for selectivity. Um, so it appears to, e each WDR is a, a new problem in and of itself. The negative results are also very important. Are those uh, failings available for learning? Yes, they will be. In air check, they will be, yeah. Okay. I've uh, still got a bit of time. So you mentioned that it, uh, probes take one to three years and two to five million to develop. Do you have a prediction on how much AI could reduce the time and cost uh, to development of a chemical probe? Um, I can't predict that. I'm the data generator. But what we would love to uh, have is to be able to computationally predict molecules that bind to your target and identify a binder maybe within a month, and then um, uh, computationally or AI guide medicinal chemistry that could then improve that uh, compound, make it um, cell permeable, uh, get into cells and modulate the target, um, maybe within several months. But that's very aspirational. So a challenge to <laughs> the AI folks in the audience. Um, one more. Um, how do you take into account the rapid transitional states of small molecules and how their interactions impact protein structure? That is a very important aspect of, of how proteins function. And crystal structures and, um, and even alpha fold structures are snapshots or uh, averages of, of a protein conformation. So that the data that I talked about that we're generating is on, you know, um, equilibrium conditions of the protein. So it's exploring all its different states in, uh, in the conditions under which we're, we're capturing small molecules to bind to. So those are kind of two separate things, then to understand how the small molecule binds to the protein. Um, 
we often need experimental uh, 3D structure determination because there's many cases where the compound uh, or the drug binds and induces a change in the, in the protein conformation that's not apparent um, before the compound bound. Yeah. Great. Thank okay. you so much. Right. Thank you, everyone. Our next speaker is Dr. Bo Wang. Uh, Dr. Bo Wang is jointly appointed in the departments of laboratory medicine and pathobiology and computer science and obtained his PhD from the Department of Computer Science at Stanford University. His work focused on developing algorithms for solving problems in computational biology with, biology with an emphasis on cancer subtype prediction and single cell analysis. He co-leads the UHN AI Hub and is Canada's first hospital chief artificial intelligence scientist. Dr. Wang holds a Canada CIFAR Artificial Intelligence Chair from the Vector Institute. He has multiple first author papers in journals such as Nature Methods and Nature Communications. And he's expanding the AI education in LMP and has recently launched a new grad course on basic principles of machine learning in biomedical research. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Bo Wang to the stage for his talk entitled, Building a Foundation Model for Single Cell Omics Using Generative AI. Hello everyone, uh, very honored to be here. Today I will talk about how to build a foundation model for single cell genomics. So first, why do I care about single cell omics? Uh, as we all know, uh, cells are the basic unit of life. Uh, however, cells can be very heterogeneous. They can come from different uh, cell types. For example, we have T cell, B cell. Uh, they, ha they may have different cell functions. They may uh, come from you know, healthy tissues or even diseased tissues. So there are multiple levels of heterogeneity within cells. And because of that, single cell uh, sequencing technology has emerged to be one of the most important sequencing technology for the past five to 10 years to understand the heterogeneity of cells. And uh, why do I care about foundation models? Uh, first of all, what are foundation models? Uh, this is a term you probably hear a lot, uh, you know, particularly post ChatGPT uh, era. Uh, you probably heard a lot of such terms uh, through social media. However, on the academic uh, setting, this term was first coined in a seminal paper uh, co-authored by many uh, Stanford uh, researchers. You can, I show the paper on the slide, you can see there's probably 100 authors. And uh, really the core idea of foundation model is that we can train this foundation model through massive amount of uh, unlabeled data on the internet, for example, uh, such as text, images, speech, you name it. And then once the foundation model is well trained, we can adapt this foundation model to many downstream tasks with few shot or even zero shot learning. So, this paper has about 300 pages long, so too long, don't read. Um, I summarize the key features to build a good foundation models uh, as A, B, C, D. So here, A algorithms. Uh, most of foundation models are based on transformer-based deep learning architect, which I will briefly talk about later on. Uh, B business, the idea of foundation model, as I mentioned before, is one foundation model can enable multiple tasks by transfer learning. And C, computing, uh, most of foundation model needs specialized hardware such as GPU or even TPUs. And D, data, and most of foundation model do require massive amount of data during uh, pre-training. And uh, this prompt me to think about the following question. Uh, since I'm a researcher uh, in single cell genomics, uh, this is my PhD thesis uh, when I was in Stanford. So I asked my question, uh, self question, can we build a foundation model for single cell data? The motivation is quite clear to me. Uh, while text uh, made of words, cells can be characterized by genes. So this analogy really inspires us to explore foundation model for single cells. Although I do, uh, I'm not claiming that biology and languages share the same mechanism, but because there's enough technical similarities, this motivated us to uh, explore these directions. But back then, we, we saw maybe this is a crazy idea. So let's see whether we have all the key uh, features, A, B, C, D, as I outlined before. 
So a algorithm, as I mentioned, most of foundation models are based on uh, attention. This was first proposed by a seminal paper uh, in 2018 by Google researchers. It's called Transformer. Basically, you have uh, very briefly you have encoder, decoder. Encoder takes the input data and project into a latent space, and the decoder takes the latent space and trying to uh, trying to reconstruct the another form of output. So if you stack enough encoders, you have BERT type of model, which again founded, uh, invented by Google. And also we have similar models in single cell genomics, uh, such as SCBERT, SCFORMER, GeneFORMER, which is a recently published in Nature. Um, on that, another angle, if you stack enough decoders, uh, you will have GPT uh, type of model, such as ChatGPT by OpenAI. And really inspired by uh, GPT type of model, we have our own. SCGPT, which will, this is the main topic of this talk. Okay, business, we have lots of applications, tasks in single cell omics. Uh, for our work, we validated on six different tasks, such as cell type clustering, batch correction, multi-omic integration, cell type annotation, gene regulatory network, and perturbation prediction. So we, there's no shortage of variety of applications of business in single cell omic. Uh, see, committee, not much to say, as, but uh, we do re realize that uh, many uh, AI models need lots of GPUs. Thanks to, shout out to Vector Institute and Community Canada. They do help us a lot with uh, GPU access. Okay, D, data. Everyone says data is a new oil for AI. And uh, thanks to Human Cell Atlas, uh, which is uh, an international initiative founded by CZI. And we have access to lots of single cell data, well curated. And specifically in this paper, we took um, 33 million uh, healthy cells from cell by gene census from CZI. And these 33 million cells cover mostly eight uh, major tissues, such as heart, blood, brain, lung, and kidney, and uh, et cetera. And this covers a huge variety by uh, covering almost 500 uh, different studies and data sets. So thanks to this initiative, we start to have lots of data to start to really think about the foundation model for single cells. So looks like we have all the key elements. That's when we start to really think about, can we build uh, SCGBD? So briefly, SCGBD consists of two steps. Uh, first step is generated pre-training, and the second step is fine-tuning towards many downstream tasks. And I will walk you through these two steps uh, one by one. So let's look at the first step, generative pre-training in SCGBT. As I mentioned, what we did is we collected 33 million uh, human healthy cells covering major tissues such as heart, blood, and then we took these 33 million cells and then trained a GPT style models. And we used about 16 A100 GPUs and trained for two weeks. And then we have the model. We, didn't, we wasn't sure whether the model is well trained, so what we did is we randomly subsampled 30,000 uh, 30, human cells, and then uh, draw a UMAP, uh, which I shown here. Oh, sorry. Uh, which I shown uh, above, and then we do find a cell type hierarchy, uh, so that gives us confidence that this uh, pre trained model was well trained. And dive deeper into a more technical aspects of SCGBT. The input to SCGBT is three, uh, three sets. First is basically gene, token, uh, gene, token, uh, gene tokens. Basically, you, we tokenize all the gene identifiers. The second input is gene expression values. Uh, what we did is we binged those gene expression values into 55 bins, and then tokenize these bins as well. The third input to SCGBD, we call it condition tokens. And this design is really uh, innovative in the sense that it gives us lots of flexibility to incorporate the metadata for uh, human cells. For example, we can use these condition tokens to uh, denote whether which gene were perturbed if it's perturbed sick. And we can use these token, uh, condition tokens to indicate which batch it comes from, which gene sequencing technology it comes from. So this design of uh, condition tokens really give us lots of flexibility to incorporate prior knowledges. And once we have the uh, gene, we have the inputs to SCGBT, 
the algorithm is nothing novel, really it's uh, a stack of transformer uh, blocks. As I mentioned, this is the major type of algorithm we use to train uh, foundation models. And uh, the key innovative in SAGBT is the design of the kind of generative pre-training. So as we know, in GPT, GPT uh, type of models, we train the model in an autoregressive manner uh, because the language has orders, which makes sense. However, uh, when it comes to single cell omics, the order of genes does not matter that much. So how do we train it in an autoregressive way is that we use the cell embedding, the, basically the CLS token in SDGPT as a cell embedding, and then we calculate the attention of every gene to this particular cell, basically indicating the importance of genes that is specific to this particular cell. And once we have this order of importance, we basically have a, we have a set of orders of genes, and then we chunk these set, set of genes into different, uh, different chunks, and then we treat them as a ordered uh, chunks of genes, and then we train them in an autoregressive way. Basically, we mask some future chunks of genes. We're trying to predict these masked genes using the previous predict genes. Certainly, so there's lots of nuance in terms of uh, how to select hyperparameter, how to select these uh, chunks of uh, genes, which I won't talk about due to time limit. Uh, with this design of causal masking in SGBD, we have a way to train SGBD in an autoregressive way. So now we have a well-trained uh, foundation model, um, SEGBT. Now we want to talk about the second step, which is fine-tuning. So there's lots of innovation we made in terms of design loss function uh, for fine-tuning. For example, when we have multiple batches of single-cell RNA-seq data, how do we design loss functions to do fine-tuning? So we designed two types of uh, loss functions. One is uh, kind of a semi-supervised way which we enforce the cells in neighbors have similar embeddings. And the second type of loss function we call it adversary loss, which basically we're trying to force the model to not uh, distinguish which batch this cell comes from so that we remove the batch effect. So once we design the loss function, the, the way to fine tune the model is quite straightforward. We basically use a standard pipeline such as you know, backprop with SGD, for example. And then we did that, and in order to test the efficacy of SGBD, we collect a multiple uh, hu human uh, blood cells, PBMC uh, 10K, which is uh, uh, one of the popular blood, uh, blood single cell data from uh, 10X. And then we compare how good it preserves the cell types and how good it uh, removes the batch effect. We report the average bio, which is the average value of uh, MI, ARI, and ASW, which is matrix to see how well you preserve the cell uh, heterogeneity. And you will find that SGBT through a bit of fine tuning can well preserve the cell type heterogeneity while removing the batch effect. And it outperforms many, many uh, specialist approaches such as Serat V3, SCVI, and Harmony. These are specialized uh, design uh, machine learning algorithm specifically for batch integration. We then move ahead to do a multi-omic integration where we not only have RNA-seq, we also have other type of omics such as ATAC-seq. And we, again, we test it on PBMC uh, human cells and we find that similarly we outperform specialist approach such as Thread V4 and SC glue. But note that we didn't have a foundation model for ATAC-seq, we only have a foundation model for RNA-seq. What we did is simply map the, uh, the beans from ATAC-seq to genes. So this is a very rough way to map a taxi to uh, RNSeq, but uh, we didn't have a foundation model for a taxi due to data limitations. And then we, we even move ahead to test a more challenging setting we call Moisac integration uh, setup in the sense that we don't have paired RNSeq and a taxi. What we have is unpaired RNSeq, a taxi, and even proteomic as well. And we find that, again, tested on PBMC, we find that SCGBD outperform many specialist approaches such as SCMOMAT in integrating uh, different omics. 
And then uh, we move ahead to test cell type annotations. Um, so we collect three data sets covering you know, immune cells, covering uh, cancer cells, and we report the accuracy F1 value of uh, cell type annotation. And you will find that, again, SDGBD outperform many specialist approaches that is specifically designed for cell type annotations. Also, many people are wondering, can you just simply do zero shot when, <clears throat> when you have a new data uh, to map the cell types? And we did that. Uh, what we did is we took the COVID-19 data set, which were never seen before during pre-training, and then we run zero shot, and we actually find very high accuracy in terms of reference mapping for cell types. And because of this success, we are working again with uh, Human Cell Atlas, to, to incorporate this functionality into cell biogene uh, portal so that when biologists have their own data, they simply run our SHBD with zero shot, which is very lightweighted, and then get all the cell type annotation in seconds. And we also find a very interesting uh, phenomenon, we call it scaling law uh, of SHGBD in, uh, in single cells. What we did is quite simple. So we randomly sampled 30,000, 300,000, 3 million, 33 million cells from human cell atlas. And then we construct SHGBD and then uh, report the accuracy on cell type annotations. And we find two phenomena, one is, uh, which is not very surprising, the more cells you pre-train on, the better accuracy it is. Another interesting observation is that once you surpass three million cells, the, the performance can start to diminish. So this gives us lots of insights about how many cells you need, what type of cells you need during uh, pre-training. And we also test on perturbation response, again, by uh, reporting the uh, accuracy on a few common uh, database and we find that SHGBD, again, outperform many specialist approach such as gears in gene perturbation predictions. A very good byproduct of SHGBD is that not only we have embeddings of cells, we also have embedding of genes. So gene embeddings really serve as a good vector to understand some of the biology and interpret SHGBD. And what we did is we perform differential pathway analysis uh, in comparison to traditional pathway analysis, such as co-expression network. And we find that through gene embeddings uh, output by SHGBT, we can actually find a lot more relevant path differential pathways uh, in comparison to just simple co-expression network. We also did a very interesting experiment that we build SHGBT per organ. For example, uh, as I mentioned, for cell uh, atlas, we have eight major organs. Some organ has more cells, some have less. And then we want to test uh, which foundation model is better. Is that the organ-specific foundation model better or the human healthy cell, uh, the general uh, foundation model uh, better? We tested on COVID-19 because we want to test our domain uh, generalization. And we find very interesting phenomena is that if you take the foundation model trained on blood and the lungs, the accuracy on COVID-19 data usually is higher than the one trained on irrelevant organs such as, for example, brain or pancreas. However, the overall human, uh, human health cell um, foundation model also serves as a very good default uh, model to start with. And realizing, as I mentioned, realizing not every wet lab, not every bio biologist have access to GPUs. So in order to uh, enable access of SCGB to everyone, we built uh, SCGBD Hub in collaboration with Amazon, uh, particularly the cloud providers, uh, AWS. And uh, we built this SCGBD Hub. I hope I can play the video, yes. So uh, because of this uh, portal, basically biologists now can simply log in this uh, portal and uh, upload their data. And then they choose which foundation model to start with, either lung or kidney. And then you set a few hyperparameters. And then you submit your job. And then you go out for a coffee. And then once you finish coffee, you come back. Uh, the results is sent to your uh, emails. And then you can download the uh, results uh, to, to visualize, for example, to analyze your biological data. And uh, although we only published this SCGB hub for, for about two months, we already have thousands of wet labs sign up to use this SGBD. All right, 
I think we're running out of time. Um, so talk about lots of uh, advantages of SCGB. Also want to acknowledge some of the limitations of SCGB. Uh, the first limitation I see is that SCGB is mostly limited to RNSIC due to data limitations. Um, we, although we did multi-army integration of ATAXIC, uh, but we actually don't have any foundation model for ATAXIC. But however, uh, we are working with Human Serial Atlas to start to accumulate uh, and collect lots of ATAXIC data, so hopefully we can build another foundation model for ATAXIC. And also, again, we don't think SGB is causal. It's still go by associations, particularly all the analysis we did for gene regular network. And uh, also, pre-training is very compute intensive. However, the good news is the fine tuning is very lightweighted. And also, the way we hope we can move forward with foundation model in single cell genome uh, community is that we can move from hypothesis driven approach to data driven approach. But this data driven approach can also incorporate some of the expertise priors. This is uh, what we hope SCGB is leading. And also, many current practice in single cell start with very small single lab validations with large uh, data consortium such as Human Serial Atlas and SHBD. We hope we can move to large scale data and multi center validations for any biological findings you have. And also, currently, for many single cell uh, pipeline, it is stepwise. All the steps are designed based on different requirements, and then the input to the next uh, step requires the output from the previous step. Uh, what we hope SCGB can bring the change to is a general use framework, and carefully designed end-to-end, -end, even optimized with specialized hardware such as GPUs. In order to achieve those goals, uh, we do think collaboration is key. We need uh, collaboration between computer scientists like myself and with many biologists to really work together to find the novel uh, biology or hypothesis. All right, with that, I want to thank all the key contributors, uh, my students, Hote and Chloe, and also Connor and Gary for help with SGBD Hub. And certainly most of the work are done by my lab. I'm just the one who speak here. All right, thank you very much. Happy to take questions. Okay, I encourage everyone to submit your questions. We do have a few already. Um, what do you think of the recent work from Kadirsky et al. showing poor performance on zero-shot zero shot tasks for S, C, G, B, T, and gene former? Do we always need fine-tuning? Yeah, very good question. So uh, I think I also responded on Twitter uh, that zero-shot uh, kind of validation is not really showing the purpose of foundation models, as also what we showed on uh, our paper. And most of tasks do require uh, fine tuning. However, we find that zero shot on reference mapping is actually very powerful already. Uh, that's because Human Cell Atlas has detailed annotations on the 33 million cells. So this is an area we hope we can improve upon. And currently, SGB is very tiny. Uh, we only have 100, only 100 million parameters and trend only on 33 million. And it's, uh, we st there's a long way to go to really uh, improve the zero shot capacity. What type of genomic data is currently not available or not large enough, but would enable future breakthroughs in your field? Yep, very good question. So I think most of common modality is RNSIC, as I mentioned. That's why we have this SGBD mostly trained on RNSIC. Ataxic start to emerge a lot more. However, in my view, I think proteomics will serve as one of the key players in the future to really you know, uh, bridge the current uh, RNA to clinic side of uh, clinical integration. Uh, we actually have quite a few coming in. Um, <laughs> have you considered non-autoregressive methods for generation during pre-training? Yeah, very good question. So there's already a few other type of models that are using basically encoder only models such as GeneFormer. And uh, actually a few external validation already verifies that SCGBT, which is trained on in an autoregressive manner, outperform GeneFormer in almost every task we can find. So this gives us confidence that uh, through this autoregressive training does improve the capacity. But certainly there's many other factors uh, playing a role here, but uh, we, have, 
we were very interested in this autoregressive training, and we find that it is more powerful than just finding embeddings of cells. Because in order to predict next genes, you actually need to understand the data distribution within single cell RNA-seq data. Can you elaborate more on what the main reason that fine tuning gives better results compared to training from scratch? Yeah, very good question. So one reason we uh, start to speculate is that some of the ground truths were obtained through very simple kind of linear methods on that specific data. And then if you, if you didn't see the data and find differential genes, it's very hard to get, actually get correct particular cell types. So that's why fine tuning, at least you kind of let the model see the data once, give you a lot of uh, advantages to, to get better accuracy. Another reason is just the current foundation model is not powerful enough. As I mentioned, it's still very small scale. So maybe once this model is better trained with more data, with uh, you know, more parameters, it can improve the zero shot. So as UHN's first chief AI scientist, where do you think Toronto is leading the way in the AI healthcare space, and how can we compete internationally? A very good question. Um, I think Toronto is a very unique place, in this, particularly for healthcare, because we have the most diverse you know, populations, and uh, you know, bias towards certain groups is a big issue in AI for healthcare. And, uh, also, University Health Network, is, which is one of the largest research hospitals in the world, have access to millions of patient data. So this gives us lots of resource to really train an unbiased AI model uh, for, for, for uh, healthcare. And also, we have the kind of fast track to actually validate some of the models and also implement the model into clinic and see how it performs with respect to different settings. So this really gives us an advantage uh, in terms of AI development and AI uh, deployment. Can you elaborate on why fine-tuned GPT outperforms traditional pathway analysis methods? More pathways identified does not necessarily mean more accuracy. That's a great question. So. Um, we actually did a very fine, uh, fine grain comparison of what type of pathway uh, did SGP find, what type of uh, pathway did uh, co-expression network find, and as you, yeah, as as I shown in the slide, the difference mainly like, uh, lies in that SGP find a lot of immune-related uh, pathways. These are important because that data set was immune cells. And uh, co-expression often find many housekeeping uh, genes or pathways, which are not super exciting for, for biological discoveries. Because co-expression is very noisy when, when you have, you know, 30, for example, 20,000 genes. Uh, we have a couple more minutes, so they're still coming in, which is great. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Uh, what kind of applications in health do you foresee for SCGPT? So, so far we mostly focus on biological discovery. Uh, we haven't really seen a great pathway to clinical integration of SHGPT yet. That's because we don't have much patient level uh, single cell data. You know, uh, because again, single cell data is very costly. It costs you know, a few thousand dollars just to, to get a sample sequenced. So hopefully as uh, sequencing cost decreases, I think the trend is very clear. Uh, we're going to see more and more patient-level single-cell data. That's when I see great opportunity for SC, like a foundation model, like a gene form or SCGVD can play a role in clinical applications. Three million cells seems to be enough for cell type labeling. For rare cell types, would you recommend to stratify downsampling, or what's their minimum number of cells? Yeah, amazing question. So, Unfortunately, I don't have a great answer about what's the uh, kind of minimum required number of cells. What we find is that for major organs, three million is a great threshold. For rare, rare cell types, it's always very hard because it's very rare, and uh, some of the cell type annotation is not very accurate. Uh, we are working with uh, Cell Atlas to, to find what a great threshold for defining uh, rare cell types. Unfortunately, there's no consensus within this community yet. And also, it's, it varies depending on which field you are studying. You know, like there's a, always a, like a joke saying, if you put five uh, 
immune uh, researchers, immune cell researchers together, they always fight, you know, because there's no consensus about the definition of cell types. So um, hopefully with more accumulated uh, studies from the field and with a consortium such as Human Cell Atlas, people start to build guidelines, you know, principles to, de to define these different cell types. I've uh, got time for one more. Yeah. Um, oh my gosh, there are so many for you. Um, <laughs> uh, okay. If you were to pinpoint a single challenge and a corresponding strategy for fine-tuning a pre-trained model, what would they be? Very good question. So um, I think almost always I would suggest to do fine-tuning at this stage. Um, and then you have to design specific loss functions for your own tasks. We provide a few examples in that paper. Different tasks do require different uh, loss function uh, design to really reflect what you need. What, basically, you need to ask the question, what, out what outcome you want from SGBT for this particular task? And once you have a clear answer to that question, you can design your loss function. The rest of fine tuning is quite straightforward. Um, for zero shot, again, um, pre-training, uh, it's, it's not very powerful yet due to data limit. That's all the time we have. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you. And sorry we couldn't answer all the questions. Thank you, Eva. Our next speaker is, and I apologize if I get your name wrong because we didn't have a chance to meet before, uh, is Dr. Duina Precup. Precup. Um, uh, Dr. Precup uh, is an associate professor at McGill University and conducts fundamental research on reinforcement learning, working in particular on AI applications in areas that have a social impact such as healthcare. She's interested in machine decision making in, dis in situations where uncertainty is high. She's a senior fellow of the Canadian Institute for Advanced Research, fellow of the Association for the Advancement of AI, and she also heads the Montreal office of Google's DeepMind. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Uh, Precup to the stage for her talk entitled Reinforcement Learning for Therapeutics. Thank you very much for the introduction. Um, Um, so I will talk today about reinforcement learning. This is a little bit of a different learning paradigm from self-supervised learning, which we've talked about before. I do split my time actually between uh, McGill and, and Google DeepMind, but the work that I'm going to talk about today is carried out at McGill, and in particular was uh, spearheaded by two of my PhD students, Shimano Basu and Emmanuel Bengio. Um, now, reinforcement learning is about learning from interaction with an environment, and it's about learning how to choose actions, right? And it's a paradigm that's been inspired, actually, from animal learning theory, where you can have an animal that interacts with its environment, takes actions, and receives a numerical reward signal that's sort of conveying how good those actions have been. And animals are very good at learning this kind of association between the numerical reward and their actions, even if this reward is delayed. And so we think about uh, digital agents as learning in the similar paradigm where they receive observations from an environment, uh, they can choose actions, and they receive numerical rewards. And part of the appeal of this, as, as Rich Sutton has said in, in a 1992 paper, is that it's really, in a sense, a whole AI uh, problem in a microcosm. Now, the question that I'm going to try and address today is whether reinforcement learning can actually help therapeutics, right? And part of this is to try and understand how we can formulate some problems in terms of reinforcement learning. What are the observations or the states of the system? What are the actions that can be chosen? What's the reward signal? We can think about where do we get the training from, right? Is there a simulator for our problem or are there good data sets that we can leverage? And then I'm also going to talk a little bit about whether current reinforcement learning algorithms are actually adequate for this uh, problem, and if not, sort of what's, what's missing. And I'm going to do this by looking at two rather different case studies. Um, and the first one that I'm going to, uh, to talk about is reinforcement learning for precision drug dosing. This is work that we published at AAAI this year. And uh, just to sort of situate the problem a little bit, um, one of the current paradoxes in drug development is that clinical trials provide evidence of efficacy and, and safety of medications by looking at populations. Um, and 
at the same time, physicians actually treat individual patients. And these patients could be rather different from the population. And in fact, uh, when you have a randomized uh, control trial, you oftentimes select patients um, for this trial in a way that's not reflected of, of the population as a whole. So for example, um, participants that are uh, in certain age ranges might be excluded. They might be excluded because uh, they are pregnant or uh, because they're taking certain medications and so on. So there's lots of exclusion criteria, which mean that in a lot of randomized uh, control trials, we actually do not have a representative pop uh, population sample. And we would like to have a way to take what's recommended from a trial and then actually try to adapt to this in order to sort of avoid uh, suboptimal dosing, right? So suboptimal dosing also often affects subpopulations. For example, women uh, are, are more likely to receive doses that are too high because maybe they're not part of these clinical trials. So precision drug dosing is a problem that uh, is uh, individually tailoring the dose of a drug uh, to, in order to uh, get the greatest benefit and the least risk for, for each patient. And in this particular case study, we looked at whether we could use reinforcement learning for precision uh, drug dosing. And so the idea is, can we actually adapt a treatment strategy to a particular individual by looking at the way that their body responds to the drug and trying to uh, sort of adapt uh, the dosing as well as the timing of the doses um, for that. Now, there's a challenge for people who know about reinforcement learning, which is that in reinforcement learning, we think of an agent that takes an action, and the effect of that action is immediate. Whereas when we are uh, administering a drug, actually there's an effect that is delayed and prolonged. So there's some time until uh, the effect sort of kicks in, and then it sort of peters out over time. And so in order to sort of take that into account, we need to modify the framework of reinforcement learning algorithms a little bit in order to account for this, which is sort of a, a feature of the problem at hand. And in order to do this, we actually looked at the pharmacology literature and, and some of the assumptions that are captured there. And you know, there's a particular way that we capture uh, action effects uh, that's, that's based on this literature. The details are not really important. What I want to, to show is a, a sort of an application of this in glucose control, okay? Um, and why we chose glucose control, because this is a case where there's a, a sort of widely accepted simulator developed in Italy that many groups have, have been using over time. And so we can actually train a system 100% safe in simulation and kind of examine its effects, the effects of the algorithms and, and run comparisons. The other reason for this is that glucose control, typically you have one variable that you mainly look at, which is insulin levels. And so it's kind of a simplified setup compared to many cases where we have lots of different uh, variables that we need to take into account. So we're gonna assume that we observe this blood glucose level. We have an action, which is to administer a, a discretized insulin dose. Um, and we have a reward function. Now, the reward function is kind of interesting to look at. Don't look at the details, just look at the, at the size of it, okay? Um, why is it so big? Well, because actually it's very tricky to figure out what's the right way to reward these systems. This has been a consistent finding in all of the applications that we've tried to do, that the reward function actually has to be sort of crafted with care and again sort of talking to the people in the field and trying to understand what they take into account and then trying to somehow formalize that in the math. Now, what methods are we looking at? We're looking at simple threshold policies. So that means, uh, you know, just whenever the insulin is, uh, whenever the glucose is above a certain level, we're just gonna administer an insulin dose. Uh, this is sort of a heuristic. Um, we're looking at uh, the DeepQ network, which is a standard reinforcement learning algorithm that was actually pioneered at DeepMind um, early on. Um, and then we're looking at uh, our method, which is effective DQN. It's a way of incorporating as part of the system's observation, it's a sort of uh, estimate of the effects of the action. And these estimates are sort of geared based on the information that we're getting uh, from this particular patient. And ADRQN is another way of incorporating history, but it doesn't necessarily think about the delayed effects of actions. It just sort of uh, uses the usual reinforcement learning assumption that actions sort of have their effects being instantaneous. And so we can look at, at uh, the results here uh, on, on the sort of uh, the, the rightmost graph, you see performance, so high is, is good. 
And on the other graph, you see computational cost, right, of this method, and so low is good. And so what we can see here is that the method, sort of in terms of quantitative measurements, is obtaining very similar results to the other method that's looking at sort of the history of actions, uh, but at a much lower computational cost, and the cost sort of stays low, regardless of how far back we're looking at this history of actions. But the other thing that's really important in medical applications is actually to look qualitatively Okay, like what are these policies actually doing? Because we can measure rewards, right? But we also want to know, are there any particular really bad side effects, right? Uh, are there any catastrophic events and so on? And so this is a little bit of a more complicated graph. At the top, we have blood glucose levels. In the middle, we have sort of what the policy is doing when it's administering insulin. And then on the, on the bottom of, each of these sets of panels is, is the food intake of this particular person, a simulated person. And so <clears throat> one thing that we can see is that, first of all, there are, uh, in all cases except for our method, there are some bad hypoglycemia events. So these are cases where the top uh, graph goes below a sort of uh, low, uh, sort of low threshold of glucose. And that's really bad because that basically means you've killed the patient. Um, DQN, which is the sort of standard algorithm, learns very quickly to just administer a flat, low rate of insulin regardless of, of anything that's happening, okay? And so that's not very adaptive, and also it means that we're basically giving too much. A little bit all the time, it sort of accumulates to too much. ADRQN, which is this algorithm that sort of uh, existed in literature before, uh, treats around meal times and whenever the, the blood glucose spikes, but treats very aggressively, okay? And that's partly because it doesn't take into account the fact that once you administer a dose, it is going to have a, an effect over some period of time. And so it just wants to give as much as possible right now because it thinks that effect is just going to diminish. Our algorithm gives sort of constant, sort of spaced out smaller doses over time. Um, and so uh, it does not end up with hypoglycemia events. It does have hyperglycemia events, which are not great either, okay? And that is partly because the reward function still is not that great. And so that's something that, that still requires improvement. So just to, to conclude to sort of this part of the talk, uh, in our opinion, reinforcement learning can provide some effective learning of precision dosing policies, but the reward design is crucial, as well as incorporating specifics of the problem, in this case of drug dynamics. Um, also, the sample efficiency of reinforcement learning definitely needs to be improved. So in this case, we simulate patients, therefore we can give them really, really, really long lives. Uh, but actually, this is a problem, right? We really need to get better algorithms. Um, as well as better simulators, right? This is a simulator that's accepted in the community. It's still quite simplified in its assumptions. And evaluating the results is also problematic right now. We're still evaluating in simulation. There's a big step that needs to be thought out about how do you then take that into the actual real world. So now I want to show you a very different case study where reinforcement learning is used not to tailor uh, treatments and doses, but actually for uh, the problem of drug discovery. So finding new molecules, uh, and this was work that was spearheaded by Emmanuel Benjo while he was a PhD student in our lab. Um, so here we're sort of focusing on small molecule drug discovery. This is where we want to find molecules that bind to particular protein targets. And uh, this is basically just a huge search problem. There is a space of molecules. Uh, we need to sort of uh, go through the space and find candidates that are promising. And one way to, to think about it is that we have sort of two things that we need to handle. One is um, how do we search efficiently? So which molecules do we actually generate to look at? The space is something like 10 to the 16 to the 10 to the 20. And most of the molecules here are bad, right? They either don't bind, they're toxic, they can't be manufactured, all kinds of problems. And so basically it's a needle in a haystack kind, kind of problem. And reinforcement learning in principle it has been used in order to find strategies for, for this type of problem. This is why we were interested in this. The other aspect is how do we actually tell if, um, if a molecule is good or not to bind to a particular target. And so sort of traditionally this has been done by sending batches to a lab 
and then having that lab look at them. This is a very lengthy process. More recently, there are noisy physics simulators that can be used. It's still expensive, but we can sort of approximate some goodness scores, for example, uh, a binding score. Um, and so that's what we're, we're mainly going to use uh, in this work. So the sort of the, the, um, the way that we think about this is we're going to uh, generate molecules. We have a cheap reward predictor that we train from data. We're going to uh, sort of then train a generator that kind of searches through the space of molecules. If we have a set of candidates that's looking promising, a slate, we are then going to really evaluate it, maybe by using a real lab, a chemistry lab, or maybe by using the sort of more expensive simulation. And then we're going to get that data back and incorporate its outcome into the reward predictor. And so the reward predictor is trained here. So how do we formulate drug discovery as a reinforcement learning problem? Well, we need to think about what are the states. The states are just configurations of molecules, and there's a standard way to represent this digitally. We think of the actions as things that we tack on to these molecules, or possibly that we can remove from these molecules. And then at some point, we end up with something that we think is interesting, and then we evaluate it. That gives us a reward. Okay. And so in this case, our reward is going to be an approximation of the docking score that we have trained from this data. Um, in principle, we can just apply reinforcement learning. The problem is that reinforcement learning traditionally is trained to find a good way of choosing actions, which means that for a particular problem, we would find one candidate, one molecule, and then every time that we run the system, we would find the same one. And so what part of the goal of this research project was to understand how we can sufficiently randomize and provide a diversity of candidates that are actually all potentially good. Uh, there are other methods that, that are geared towards this Markov chain Monte Carlo, for those who know, is, is one particular uh, example of such a method, but it's pretty slow and actually can also get stuck. And of course, generative models, have, like we've discussed in, in the previous talk, actually, these are also um, <clears throat> sort of um, more, more recently, a really good way of, of constructing uh, all kinds of data, including possibly molecules. But in our case, we really want to be more efficient. And so we don't just want to construct interesting high reward molecules. We also want to avoid things that are low reward. So the, we published in uh, 2021 a paper called GFLONET. It's a generative framework for discrete objects uh, that is essentially uh, understanding how to sample the space in a way that we get molecules in proportion to how good their reward is, okay? And so just to give you a, a sort of a picture of, of uh, what this is like, we have uh, a graph. Imagine that each sort of node in this graph is actually one of these molecules. Each edge is maybe adding something to this molecule. And we want to sort of traverse this graph in a, such a way that we end up at the square nodes, the sort of terminal nodes, in proportion to how good they are. Okay. And so one way to think about it is that if you had the whole graph in mind, you could sort of send these particles down and you want them to sort of pipe through these edges in such a way that we end up at the, at the end nodes in proportion to the rewards. And you can actually sort of write down the math of this for a, a directed acyclic graph, what, which is what we have here. And we end up with, a, with an equation which made me very happy because it looks like a reinforcement learning equation. Okay? And so we have a, a big uh, arsenal of tools that we can use to, to solve approximately these kinds of problems. Now, this is sort of the nice picture, and it's got some nice theorems in the paper and so on. The practice is a lot messier, because actually, if I just take that objective function and try to optimize it, it turns out that it's not very well behaved. And so we have to like do some nitty gritty details on the reward specification and on the objective function specification in order to make it well behaved. But with this, we can actually uh, really get these uh, sort of systems, which are essentially uh, deep networks, uh, to sample the space of molecules pretty effectively. And so here, we are looking at the problem where well, we pre-train a reward function on 300,000 molecules. And we are looking at how many modes, that means sort of different kinds of, of good molecules, are we able to find um, as we uh, sample more and more states in the system. Okay. And so the blue, the blue curve there is the GFLONET approach. We're comparing it against a more traditional reinforcement learning approach called PPL and against the, what was at the time a state of art, most sort of molecule generation uh, program called MARS. And so in the rightmost graph, you can see that we find uh, a lot of rewarding modes a lot quicker. 
Okay, so that also saves, saves some computation. Uh, on the other graph, we're sort of looking at the average reward of a slate of molecules that we're getting, right? And so again, what we're seeing is that we are obtaining good slates of molecules quicker, right? And so this would sort of speed up the process of actually examining these. Uh, we have also looked at the problem of essentially doing batch active learning where we put the system in a loop with retraining the reward. And so we make a slate of candidates, we sort of ship it, we get a better reward estimate, we retrain the reward model. And in this case also our, our approach performs better um, than sort of the, the state of art program. Um, and we're looking in this case both at picking sort of 10 molecules at a time as a slate, also at picking 100 molecules at a time at, as a slate. And this is because sometimes we can you know, only work with the lab and sometimes we can work digitally and then of course we can evaluate more at a time. So th this is sort of a, a generative model for discrete objects based on a reinforcement learning like learning objective. Um, it's a general setup really for, for solving black box optimization problems. It allows exploration and the interesting thing is that Unlike in reinforcement learning, where eventually the way of moving through the sort of space would become deterministic, here we have sort of a stochasticity that never goes away, and that's by design. Um, it's easy to incorporate information about uncertainty in the reward function. And so, for example, we knew if we knew how bad our, our docking score estimates are, if we had some error margins, we could incorporate that in the process. And in general, it's a, it's a framework that can be used for causal modeling or, or discovery da data explanations. And there's actually a large group of students at, at Mila that's sort of exploring various aspects uh, of this problem. Again, I want to emphasize we need to design the reward function appropriately. Um, and so here, uh, it was more in terms of the numerics of it, right? But that's really a, a big part of making this kind of system work. So in my opinion, reinforcement learning actually has a lot of potential uh, in terms of solving uh, therapeutics problems, whether that is treatment design or drug design. Uh, the reward function is really crucial, as well as finding a good way to incorporate the specifics of the problem. And I'm going to uh, echo something that uh, Professor Wang said uh, before, which is we really need collaboration, right? A, a big key of making these kinds of projects work is actually to have an interdisciplinary team where there has to be a discussion between the computational scientists and, and the, the medical uh, personnel or, or the biology uh, personnel uh, to understand how the specifics uh, can be incorporated. From my point of view, it's also interesting because it's a great opportunity to improve existing algorithms and to actually, uh, for example, understand if we can get reinforcement learning to work in a, in a better uh, sample efficiency mode. So thank you very much for your attention and happy to take questions. Thank you so much. Uh, so we just have one question come in. You've left people speechless, so I encourage everyone to submit your questions, um, or I can give the mic if anyone wants to do it in person. Um, so could you use something like RLHF for optimal patient treatment? That's a really interesting question. Um, so just re reinforcement learning from human feedback is basically this kind of methodology which uh, looks at two solutions and decides sort of, you know, you have a patient decide which one is better and then we incorporate that information into a reinforcement learning algorithm. A place where this could be really interesting actually is where we can have trade-offs, right? So if you have medications, they have side effects. Some patients would prefer uh, more medication despite the side effects, others really mind the side effects. And so that's a case where I can imagine something like this being taken into account in order to kind of provide something on a Pareto front that is adapted to the patient. It's, as far as I know, it's not really something that's actually been done, but perhaps also because this whole field of using reinforcement learning for medical treatment is, is uh, quite new. Um, it, you know, a lot of the work that's being done has been more supervised learning, unsupervised learning, self-supervised, these kinds of methods that don't actually require action. What experimental approaches are you taking to validate the AI models you've built? Uh, that's a really great question. And again, I'm, as I mentioned, it's one of the challenges. So one way that we do it is right now we are confined to simulation. And so we sort of, one way to, to uh, sort of approach the problem is to train on some simulations and test on others and have a, a wide enough space of, of these simulations uh, that allows us to have diversity in that kind of process. Um, 
Ideally, we would eventually test in the population, but that is very hard to do, right? And we need to really make sure that, that safety is, is respected. Um, in the case of, of the molecule discovery problem, we are actually working with some collaborators in the chemistry department uh, at McGill, uh, as well as some people in the faculty of medicine. And so they are helping us uh, validate uh, some, of the, some of the molecules. And eventually, again, I think that a lot of this is going to end up being an interdisciplinary effort of trying both to develop the tools better as well as to understand how to, how to validate at scale. Can reward function be learned from the existing data? Yes, whenever we have enough data that, that, uh, that is reflective. And so this is exactly what we are doing, in fact, in this sort of uh, molecule uh, discovery case. Um, in the diabetes case, we did not attempt to learn a reward function from the data because we sort of, we went into it basically thinking, uh, this is actually pretty straightforward, right? We're gonna do the simplest thing that you do in reinforcement learning, which is, you know, you reward how long the patient is living, right? And we quickly found out that this is just not something that, uh, that is going to work out. And so then, you know, Sumana, the student sort of leading the project, spent a lot of time actually trying to understand how to make this re reward function reflective of various considerations, right? Including not just how, you know, whether you've exceeded a bad threshold or not, but how close you are to it. In the end, I don't think that it was, uh, you know, in hindsight, look at the, re the reward function, it's clear what it's doing. But it was a lengthy process, and it, in my experience, it has been sort of repeated every time that we've tried to do an actual application. And I'm not entirely sure that this can actually be automated with the amounts of data that we currently have. If we had more data, that would be great. What regulatory roadblocks must be overcome to allow personalized dosing? Is this limited to clinical trials, to post-trials after approval, or can it help both? I think in the long run, uh, probably we will figure out better ways of doing things. Right now, it's still, the, you know, the practice is still randomized controlled trials. Um, a lot of this comes into play really when you have uh, treatment that extends over a long period of time, so more situations like chronic diseases and so on. And so I think, I know that there was a lot of interest at the FDA in finding sort of new ways of, of validating some of these sort of uh, treatments. Obviously, there always has to be medical personnel in the loop. I think if there was a way, for example, to deploy some of these strategies in a limited context and get feedback from the patients or from the medical personnel about how well they are doing, this would really go a long way. But we, you know, in terms of uh, validation, p-values are very clear. This other kind of uh, sort of statistics that are involved are, are a lot less clear. How do you view reinforcement learning as a domain for black box exploration and optimization? So I think reinforcement learning really has a lot of potential to improve, in fact, black box uh, exploration and optimization. That's kind of where the sort of GFLOW net technology is going. Um, and that's partly because there is a lot of methodology that we have figured out in reinforcement learning that can be successfully used in the setting. And that's sort of, uh, you know, what we're piggybacking on right now in sort of this like little GFLOW net student community that's been developing is actually trying to bring some of the sort of standard ideas in reinforcement learning, uh, you know, experience replay, uh, prioritization, uh, hindsight learning, and, and so on to this kind of methodology. So I think we're going to see more of that uh, sort of coming into play. Do you think that RL can be used as part of the fine-tuning process for transformer-based generative models? It is actually uh, used in, in that respect, certainly in, uh, in the uh, language generation, text generation uh, community, that is reinforcement learning from human feedback is sort of the, the standard way of, of doing fine-tuning. Are you participating in the CASH competition for your small molecule discovery program? We have not done that, no. Uh, maybe it's something that we should consider. That's a good point. What is enough data in the case of RL? How much of the space does the model need to see to make accurate predictions? It really depends on the problem and whether we also have any kind of pre-existing data to train on. Uh, you know, to give a, a sort of a, a sense in the diabetes simulation, we have millions of time steps, right, that we're taking into account. And so for a particular patient, you know, that means multiple lifetimes for that patient. So in order to really train a, a good policy. 
Now, one way to, to make this better is to leverage pre-existing data and start not from scratch, but start with a policy that's mimicking what's done in that data. So for example, if we had, let's say, a standard protocol for treatment, we could sort of start with that and then perturb around that rather than starting from scratch. That's not what we did in this particular project. Uh, we have time for probably two more. Uh, how is the environment simulated to yield the reward from patients in precision drug discovery? So what we do here uh, in, precision, uh, in uh, precision drug dosing is we run the simulator and we have our reward function on top. And so the reward function is looking at the state of the patient basically at the, at the blood glucose level and the history of that blood glucose level in order to evaluate the outcome. Um, in general, we can take a simulator and interface it with a reward function that has access to the sort of the, the part of the simulator that would be visible to a physician treating that patient. Uh, one last question related to... Oh. Is my... Okay. One last question related to an earlier one. How receptive do you think decision-making bodies would be to simulation outcomes? For example, RCTs are considered gold standard for uh, data outcomes and decision-making. So I, I really think that simulators are not enough, right? And so this is where I can see two paths, and I don't know where this is going to end up. One path I can imagine is having validated simulators, right? So that you know, if the simulator is considered good enough, uh, one can then move into a clinical trial phase with that. Another path is basically to uh, sort of look at problems again where maybe the stakes are not so high, right? and where there can be a blend of validation and simulation, and then also validation in real life. The fact of the matter is, reinforcement learning systems, you really understand what's happening with them when you actually sort of observe the outcomes of, of them acting in, in the real world. And so that's been one of the challenges, and one of the reasons, frankly, why I've only come to use reinforcement learning for medicine in the last couple of years, even though I've done sort of medical applications for maybe more than a decade. It's been more in the sort of traditional supervised setting. Thank you so much. Thank you for a great talk. And thank you again to our audience for fantastic questions. Fantastic. So hello, everyone. I'm Leah Cowan, Vice President of Research and Innovation and Strategic Initiatives at the University of Toronto, and thrilled to be here for such a fantastic event and delighted to chair the rest of the session for this morning. So it is my pleasure to introduce Dr. Artem Babien, who is the winner of the 2023 Gairdner Early Career Investigator Competition. So every year, the Gairdner Foundation invites early career investigators from across Canada to submit an application to present their research as part of the Gairdner Science Week events. Dr. Babien was chosen by Drs. Hassabis and Jumper. Dr. Babien is an assistant professor in the Department of Molecular Genetics and the Donnelly Center at the University of Toronto. Dr. Babian's research interests are very broad. They lie in bioinformatics, computational biology, cancer, epigenetics, epigenomics, evolution, phylogenetics, functional genomics, systems biology. I'm about halfway through. Genome analysis, sequencing, global health, non-coding DNA and RNA, infectious disease, microbiology, microbiome, translation, post-transcriptional regulation, and viruses. Exciting. <laughs> so buckle up. We are very excited uh, for this talk. And please join me in welcoming Dr. Artem Babien to the stage. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you for, uh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to speak. Uh, you know, I'm deeply humbled that I can share some of this research that I've been passionately working on for the last few years with you. So the title of my talk today is called Entering the Platinum Age of Virus Discovery. And so like many projects in virology, this began around March of 2020, March 2nd of 2020. It was very obvious even back then that this was going to be a society changing event. I'm talking about COVID-19, of course. And I could see that the global research community was spending billions of dollars on genomic surveillance. We were watching as this virus, through its sequencing, was unfolding in front of us in real time. I decided that I had a responsibility as a scientist 
to do my part and help in any way that I could, and that was through computational analysis. And so I decided to ask a simple question, not where is this virus going, but where is this virus coming from? What are the proximal and evolutionary origins of SARS-CoV-2, one of 44 known coronaviruses at the time? And this isn't just an academic question. SARS-CoV-2 was predicted to infect over 80 species of mammal biochemically in February of 2020. And the concern at the time uh, was that if this virus entered one of these animal reservoirs, it would be able to mutate or recombine with another coronavirus and then spill back into humans. And as we were pushing towards getting herd immunity and vaccine immunity, that type of change could essentially destroy all the herd immunity we were so strongly pushing for. That was actually quite prophetic. SARS-CoV-2 has now been reported to infect over 24 species of mammal, including stable deer-to-deer -deer transmission in white-tailed deer in Ontario and Michigan, meaning that that has now entered a new animal reservoir and is likely to be there forever. And this actually kind of ties back to a bigger point. It's important to understand that Viruses are not just limited to humans. We are part of a greater ecosystem. The health of the animals and the environment around us is directly tied to our human health. We now have a case study how a bat virus in China is causing trillions of dollars of economic damage in America. And so where do you go looking for viruses when all you have is a laptop? Well, I decided to turn to public sequencing data. I hypothesized that there would be coronaviruses already sequenced in publicly available data that were missed. And so there's this database called the Sequence Read Archive. Uh, this is the global collection of public sequencing data. Every scientist, when you're publishing your paper, that raw data gets deposited into the SRA and is available for free use. By happenstance, in February of 2020, all of the data on the Sequence Read Archive was mirrored onto Amazon Cloud and Google Cloud as part of a major infrastructure project at the NIH. And so to put that into perspective, how much data are we talking about? This is volumes of data that have been growing exponentially since 2008, when the database was started. And we are currently in excess of 60 petabases of sequencing data. So that's one nucleotide followed by 15 zeros. Another way to think about that is that if you were to generate that volume of sequencing data, you would have to run machines for 3.7 to 14.9 billion dollars. And that is just the direct sequencing cost that does not account for sample acquisition or personnel costs. So we can conservatively say there is a 50 billion dollar resource available if we can analyze it. So this seemed like an almost impossible task. And so, um, oh sorry, but before I get to that, if you'd come away from this talk with just one idea, I want you to conceptualize the Sequence Read Archive as the modern library of Alexandria for genetics. We have incredibly rich genetic information from all over the world, from tumor samples taken here at SickKids Hospital to uh, ant mound in the Amazon basin, all the way to anal swabs of penguins taken in Antarctica and everything in between. And so to analyze this enormous volume of data, we had to create a new cloud-native computing architecture, which we called Serratus. I'm not going to get into too much of the technical details, but suffice to say, we aggressively cost-optimized how we are doing this analysis, this bioinformatic alignment problem. And the main problem that we had to overcome was actually not how do we use more CPUs, is how do we move data fast enough? This is called I.O. And so essentially, once we solved that I.O. problem, we could scale horizontally and just fire up 22,000 CPUs and churn through incredibly large volumes of data quickly. How quickly? Using Serratus, we can process over 1 million sequencing libraries per day. The cost of an analysis per library is under one US penny, one to half a cent uh, per data set. To put that into perspective, we are now able to analyze sequencing data faster than the world is producing that sequencing data. This is a fundamental shift in computing capacity. And so, you know, all of a sudden we built a really, really big hammer. We decided we're going to look for a bigger nail. We weren't just going to do every coronavirus. We were going to look for every RNA virus, full stop. And so to do that, we focused on this one gene called the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. You can think of this as the beating heart of a viral genome. All RNA viruses, by definition, share it. But 
this is a very rapidly evolving gene. The outside, the protein sequences changes incredibly rapidly. So to be able to organize that volume of data, we had to invent a molecular barcoding system, which we call palm prints, that focuses on the catalytic core of the RDRP, these A, B, and C motifs. So that way, all this sequence essentially turns into a barcode, and we could know where RNA viruses are and which one they are. So we went to public sequencing databases, so this is now by the end of 2020, and we collected and curated every RNA virus that had ever been defined, and that gave us 15,000 species units. Then we took, that, uh, we took those sequences, and we applied Serratus, and we searched every single RNA sequencing data set that we could get our hands on with no bias about what we are looking for. We searched 5.7 million sequencing libraries or 10.2 petabases of sequencing data. Using that, we discovered over 130,000 novel species of RNA viruses in 11 days. So let me reframe that. It took the global virology community 130 years to find the first 15,000 RNA viruses, and we found the next 130,000 in under two weeks. And so now, what was a computationally uh, intensive and difficult problem, essentially, you can now find new viruses on our web interface by doing a simple database query. We can just go to coronaviruses, highlight all the samples that have a coronavirus under 90% identity, the new species, and then do a focused analysis of those data sets. And the beauty of doing a large unbiased screen is you end up in places you entirely did not expect to go. And we found nine new species of coronaviruses in aquatic vertebrates, so the axolotl, seahorse, fugu fish. And as we started to interrogate these coronaviruses, these divergent coronaviruses, we kept running into this problem where we were getting the RDRP and the non-structural genes of the genome, but we weren't able to find the spike and the structural parts. And after a bit of kind of bioinformatic, uh, bioinformatic sleuthing, we were able to identify that in these diverged coronaviruses, these structural genes occur on a separate molecule. So if you open up your virology textbook, it'll tell you that coronaviruses are one linear molecule, but these coronaviruses violate that definition where they occur on two molecules, similar to how influenza viruses are organized, segmented genomes. This actually now ties into a much broader story of where the field is moving. The, global, uh, the World Health Organization recently put out a white paper defining how global genomic surveillance is going to be an important public health measure all over the world, especially in resource-limited settings. And one of the th key things that they identified was that there is a high technical and financial cost to doing genomic surveillance. So now here in Toronto, the mandate of my lab is to overcome that barrier. We want to create state-of-the-art computational tools, develop them freely, distribute them, and so that they can be applied meaningfully in resource-scarce settings where they can do the most good. And that probably ties into a greater theme with all of these AI talks. We are entering an era of enormous volumes of data, but we are still inhibited by translating this enormous volume of data into meaningful knowledge. So you can think of that as a publication, as a Wikipedia page, as a, as a figure, something that is human interpretable. Because that base of knowledge, that's going to give us that little bit of wisdom. So when the next pandemic rolls around, we know how to respond better. We can make better decisions to save more lives. And so I really view kind of the objective of my lab is really at that interface of data and knowledge. We need to create the knowledge systems for um, the world to use. And so you can now reconceptualize the sequence read archive as a planetary passive viral surveillance network, where as sequencing data is growing exponentially faster than Moore's law for a trivial cost of something like $80,000 a year, we can monitor all of that data. And if a pathogen that presents with a danger to people arises, we can identify it quickly, cheaply, and then act sooner so that we can mitigate future outbreaks or pandemics. And so you might say, okay, well, if the data is growing exponentially, are you expecting to find another 150,000 viruses in another year? Well, no. That actually underestimates um, what we're, what's going to happen. That's because if you take a, a look at that green curve right there, that's diamond, that's the algorithm we used. As viruses diverge from a reference sequence, so at 100%, by the time that virus diverges 50%, 
we have a less than 50% probability of detecting that with Serratus. So that means that if you take a look at the histogram of our data, as the new viruses dip down, that dip down is completely artificial. It's a technical signal. It's not biological, which means that what we did with Serratus is the tip of an enormous iceberg of viral biodiversity. We have only begun our work here. And so one way to address this is kind of the classical side blast method. Well, we ran a search. We found new sequences. Let's repeat and build out and explore into this dark matter of RNA viruses like an onion. I was always taught that the best scientists are lazy. And so I thought, well, why not spend a lot of effort, try to find a few representatives of these dark RNA viruses, and then we can, using those representative sequence, repeat serratus and explode the space of viral biodiversity. And that's essentially what we've done. Thanks to the folks at AlphaFold, shout out, you guys did a great job there. Uh, we took 50,000 sequencing libraries, we clustered them into 39 million open reading frames, and we just threw AlphaFold at them. Because AlphaFold is able to do this search for that same palm print molecular signature in the space of structures. So we can go behind the veil of what was the previous technical limits for identifying novel viruses. And then we took those representative sequences, the database has grown, and we have now reprocessed 7.5 million sequencing runs. And so, as you can see in our 2022 study, we found that in those 130,000, those are three other major studies in virus discovery. And currently, we have found now over a quarter million new RNA viruses, putting the total count to over half a million RNA viruses characterized. And this isn't to say, like, oh, pat myself on the back, we did a great job, we took the known viral and we exploded it. I think that is kind of a, a bit of a short-sighted view. The real perspective to have here is that we have not even begun. If you take even all of this information that we found and you compare that to the global genetic diversity of the RNA virum out there, we have not even scratched the surface. This is why I think we are entering the most exciting era of virus discovery and virology that has ever happened before. And so if you combine this exponential data growth with improvements in data analysis, together, we are on track to characterizing 100 million RNA viruses by 2030. But more importantly, it's not about just this number of getting more and more viruses. It's about asking, what's the next one that's going to matter? What's the next one that could potentially cause a pandemic? Which one is causing Alzheimer's disease or IBD or some other disease of unknown etiology? If we have now data analysis capacity that was completely impossible just two years ago, we need to fundamentally ask uh, the most important questions that we can come up with. Where can we do the most good by finding that next one? And so thank you for your time. Uh, so I've now opened, as of last year, the laboratory for RNA-based life forms across the street at the Donnelly. Uh, if anyone is interested in AI, and kind of pushing the frontier of virus discovery, be sure to find me in chat. I'd love to pick your brain. I am hiring. Thank you. Fantastic. I don't see how anyone couldn't be interested, <laughs> so beware. Fantastic talk, truly inspiring. So I'd encourage folks to submit their questions uh, to the Slido platform. And uh, they're starting to come in. So here's your first question. In which kind of data did you discover more viruses? So th there's kind of like a balance. The volume of viruses, the most that we find are in what are called environmental samples. So soil, water, air, uh, places where like people stick a swab where you, know, you wouldn't normally in a laboratory, right? The places where we found the most meaningful viruses are in kind of RNA-seq, classical transcriptome data. So the axolotl coronavirus, for example, that was from two different studies in America where they were studying limb regeneration in axolotls. Unbeknownst to them, their animals were infected by this axolotl coronavirus. They would have never have looked for that virus, right? Because you have to specifically look for viral sequences. And so all of these viruses, not all, but I'd say a good chunk of the kind of meaningful viruses are completely incidental findings. This is why this data sharing in the sequence read archive is so important, is we can use other people's data and look at it in a completely new light. Excellent, thank you. So next question. 
Do you think that SARS-CoV-2 was present in other mammals before humans? Well, it, it must have been present in some. So, you know, I think phylogenetically, it clearly is related to these beta coronaviruses, uh, sarbacoviruses that are from predominantly found in bats. So the question is like, is there another intermediate, right? Or how did it get out of this kind of bat reservoir? I think is uh, a bit open-ended, but absolutely. It is 100% uh, a zoonotic virus at some respect. Looking back, that was that question. Next, we're going to look forward. So how do you predict you know, which virus could become pathogenic to humans in the future? So that's another fantastic question. So um, there's about 300,000. The estimate is that there's about 300, vir 300,000 viruses that have the potential to infect mammals. There are 160 known viruses that can infect humans, RNA viruses, I should say. Um, there probably is a very large space of viruses that are in, say, a mammal or bird reservoir that could infect humans given the opportunity, right? And then it's not real. I don't think that we'll be able to just pluck out and be like, oh, these are the ones that for sure will cause the next pandemic. What we have to do is survey kind of the entire space so that we at least are aware of what's out there. That way, if a child shows up with a fever of unknown origin here at Sick Kids Hospital, we can create the computational tool to link that patient's blood, uh, the virus in that patient's blood, to a camel sampled in sub-Saharan Africa in 2012. And that should be done in 30 seconds and cost half a cent. Fantastic. So another question here is, all the sequence data a good fit for large language models? Uh, there has been some success with large language models that work and operate directly on sequence space. I actually think that there's probably going to be more meaningful uh, development of AI technologies when you don't just look at, say, like the Kamer representation of sequences, but are able to add in additional data such as structure from AlphaFold, I think. That's, that's more meaningful in many ways. Excellent. So another question about sort of geopolitics, if you want to tackle that one. So how does sort of data accessibility, maybe we'll frame it as, you know, influence your ability to do this kind of work? I, I think it's a, it's a central part of the work, right? So all of the data that we produce, like, is immediately released into the public domain. Uh, so we are reusing public domain data, and we are creating public domain analyzed data. And I think that that's important because you know, we're kind of the stepping stone to allowing virology to enter this computational field. But the only reason that this project is possible is because of this like standard of ethics of data sharing that was developed during the Human Genome Project, right? So, um, you know, the Toronto Protocols, the INSDC, so the, the policy that regulates uh, gen bank sequences and SRA sequences, having that very strong ethic of data sharing as part of like the culture of science is enabling this type of research. And I think it also has enabled things like the PDB to be turned into AlphaFold. And really, the entire AI revolution in biology is being powered by open access data. Fantastic. So another question here. How do you think you can leverage the kind of knowledge and insights you're generating to guide treatment for viral infections? So that's something that we're actually have been exploring because you know we're essentially doing a very detailed characterization of this one enzyme, the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase, and there are antiviral targets to the RDRP, right? So like that's how I think molponavir uh, operates. So this data that we're creating. Also, we're hoping to translate that into, you know, maybe we should pitch it to cash or something, right? Like, take these sequences, and then can we find broad spectrum antivirals so that, say, if another pandemic agent or, you know, another outbreak happens, not just in humans, in veterinary or plants, that we already have a pre-computed arsenal of antivirals that will work on these obscure and highly diverged viruses. Fantastic. I'm going to just take a quick look at uh, Janet, because we could carry this conversation on easily for another hour. Time for a break. So, Artem, I'd like to thank you for a phenomenal talk and note that there are dozens and dozens and dozens more questions for you. Uh -huh. So people can find you in the break. Uh, and I encourage everyone to, to keep the conversation going. We will reconvene at 11...
10 is the schedule, so we are going to stick to that schedule. So enjoy your eight minutes of freedom, and we will see you back for another stimulating session. Thank Take you. care. Welcome back. We know that uh, there's lots of exciting conversations to be had uh, on so many fronts, but we also appreciate that there's great talks coming forward in this session and you all want to hear them and we are going to make that happen. So everyone, please uh, come take your seats and we will be ready to move forward with our next talk. I am absolutely delighted to have the opportunity to introduce Dr. Elaine Nsuisi, an associate professor in the Department of Global Health at Boston University School of Public Health. She also leads the Racial Data Tracker Program at Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research. She is a data science faculty fellow and was a founding faculty member of the Boston University Faculty of Computing and Data Sciences. She currently co-leads the Artificial Intelligence Machine Learning Consortium to Advance Health Equity and Researcher Diversity, AIM AHEAD program at the National Institutes of Health through the Intergovernmental Personnel Act Mobility Program. Dr. Nsuisi completed her PhD in Computational Epidemiology from the Genetics, Bioinformatics and Computational Biology Program at Virginia Tech. Her PhD dissertation was in sensitivity analysis and forecasting in network epidemiology models. And this was at the Network Dynamics and Simulation Sciences Lab at Virginia Tech Biocomplexity Institute. After postdoctoral associate position at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital, she joined the faculty of the Institute for Health Metrics and Evaluation at the University of Washington. And I am thrilled to hand the stage over to Dr. Elaine Nsuisi. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here to talk to you about AI and health equity. I want to thank the organizers for inviting me to give this talk. My talk is a little bit different from the ones that you've heard this morning, and I'm going to start with a story. So in 2021, the Boston University School of Public Health and the Boston University Center for Anti-Racist Research held a symposium on anti-racism as public health policy. One of the speakers at that symposium was a legal scholar and a professor called uh, Patricia Williams. And she talked about an experience that she had at a doctor's visit. So she was visiting the doctor to talk about osteopenia and osteoporosis care. And the doctor was asking her a series of questions. He was using the algorithm to generate the questions. And she knew this because she studies algorithms. And so the doctor was open, to, open with her about that fact. And so the doctor was asking questions, and at some point the doctor stopped asking questions. And so she asked the doctor to change her race in the algorithm from black to white. The doctor did that, and suddenly the algorithm had more questions. He asked her about her medical history, asked her if she had any broken bones, asked her about her family history. And this is a pretty good example of what happens when algorithms are trained with data that's either biased or data that is not representative of the different populations that we're trying to study. So you can think about this at an individual level, but if you think about it at a much broader level, which is what happens when we treat AI models and apply them to entire populations, the impact can be very significant. So this is what motivates my work. I'm going to start off by talking to you all, defining what health equity is and how I think about health equity. So health equity is assurance of the conditions for optimal health for all people. Achieving health equity requires valuing all individuals and populations equally, recognizing and rectifying historical injustices, and providing resources according to need. Health disparities will be eliminated when health equity is achieved. I really love this graphic because I think it captures this so beautifully. A lot of the time when I talk to people about equity, they think about equality, and equality is quite important. But when we talk about equality, we mean giving everyone the same thing. So everyone needs some kind of vehicle to move around. We, all, we give them all the same bicycle, the same size, whether you're small, you're big, you get the same bicycle. When we talk about equity, we have to think about the needs of the individuals or the needs of the populations that we're trying to serve. We have to think about the circumstances and the conditions that impact them and provide resources to them so they can achieve optimal health 
based on what your needs are. So different individuals will get different types of resources. And it can be really challenging to implement equity because sometimes it means someone gets more than another person. So if someone has a lot less and a lot, a lot more obstacles to achieve optimal health, they might need a lot more resources than someone else who already has those resources and can achieve optimal health. So a lot of my work involves thinking about how we can achieve equity, how can we advance health equity. So in the space of AI, in the space of global health, I, I think as well, there is the need for representation. There's a need for bringing individuals, voices that are not typically represented in this space. And when we talk about AI specifically, we talk about a lack of diversity in data, but also a lack of diversity in the researchers that develop the models that we use in everyday practice. And diversity in data, um, depending on what kinds of data sets you're talking about, can involve having some populations not represented in the data, but it could also involve representing people in the data sets in a way that is very biased. And so being able to identify that and deal with those biases is, is a challenge, but it's quite important for us to achieve health equity. And also communities that are most impacted by AI when AI doesn't work the way that it's supposed to work are usually the ones that are left out of this conversation. So we want to think about what are the risks that AI might perpetuate when the models or the data sets that we're using to train the, mo uh, the AI models are quite biased. In a lot of cases, the algorithms that we develop, if we don't have this type of representation in data and people, means that some people benefit, others don't benefit. We also tend to have limited understanding of health disparities and inequities. So when we assume, so for example, I was born and raised in Cameroon, but I've lived in the US for many years now. So I can't really go to a village or a community in, in Cameroon and say, I am going to solve your health problems because I don't really understand the context in the way that it needed to be understood. So it's very important for us to allow individuals who experience in health inequities to drive the research when we're trying to solve the problems that are effect in them. And lastly, there's limited understanding of historical and present day policies that perpetuate inequities. So when I ex told the story about the osteopenia and osteoporosis experience of um, Patricia Williams to a class, the professor told me that when she was in medical school, what she learned was that it was mostly white women who had osteoporosis. So if you bring in that context, to your model, then you can see why that would be a problem and why she would have the experience that she had. So probably the data that was used to train the model mostly represented white women and didn't really have a good representation of black women. There's a lot of work that's happening, um, especially on the African continent. I wanted to give some examples and also talk a little bit about in my head. So there are a few examples here on the slide. There is over here, this is Data Science Africa, Data Sciences Network, Deep Learning Daba. Deep Learning Daba currently is one of the largest, or actually the largest AI conference that is being uh, led by Africans, for Africans. It is held on the continent, across the continent in different cities every year. It's quite exciting to see different individuals come in and present research that they are doing to address the problems in their own communities. Data Scientist Network is based in Nigeria and is also has similar aims to create capacity in data science and AI. And Data Science Africa, which was started in 20, 2015, um, is also focused similarly. Uh, we have summer schools and workshops across the continent. So to talk a little bit about In My Head, In My Head is at the National Institute of Health in the US. The project aims to enhance participation and representation of researchers and communities that are currently underrepresented in the development of AI models. It also wants to empower these communities to use AI to address health disparities and inequities and to improve the capabilities of AI by starting with electronic health records data and extending to other types of data, including social determinants of health data. And also, to mention Data Science Africa, Data Science Africa was started in 20, uh, 2015, as I mentioned, by 
researchers in Kenya and from Cambridge as well. So it was a joint collaboration and it's been running ever since. There are summer schools and workshops being held across the continent. And it's mostly focused on training individuals in the science. And then for the workshops, you have people coming from across the continent to present research that they're working on in their various communities. It offers research grants, offers fellowships, basically focused on creating capability across the continent. So moving on to my research, so this is another way in which I think about health equity, so how can I advance health equity use in research? My research for the last 10, 11 years is mostly focused on how do we use data that we're constantly producing using digital devices for public health purposes. So how can we use this to improve public health surveillance? So I've done everything from using data from crowdsourcing websites, so these are websites or uh, mobile apps that you will get um, it will ask you questions about whether you experience a symptom of a particular disease, or if you go out to a restaurant and you eat and you, you think that you were infected because of the food that you consumed at that restaurant, you could go to a website. I don't know if this is still up, actually. I was poisoned.com, and you can report that. And usually they look at groups of people reporting instead of an individual. So if it's just you, maybe it's something you ate at home two days ago, and you had the incubation period, and now you have symptoms. But but if five people go out to a restaurant and all eat and get sick, then that's probably an indication that they, they got infected at the restaurant. We've done a lot of work with search data where we try to understand how we can use search data to improve infectious disease surveillance, trying to get sickness a lot earlier than we would usually get from traditional surveillance systems. So just to go back again to the crowdsourcing website, so one thing that we do, especially with foodborne illnesses, is to develop a platform. So we worked with local departments of health where we mined information specifically from Twitter where if someone said, I ate somewhere, I got sick, and they posted it on Twitter, we'll capture that information and we'll provide it to the local Department of Health, and then they can follow up. They can ask that individual for more information, do more investigation, and in that way, it could detect outbreaks that were not being reported to the Department of Health. We've done a lot of work um, around consumer reviews as well, so specifically around food illnesses and unsafe food products. So when people eat and they go to websites like Yelp and write reviews, we capture that data and use it for that purpose. We've also looked at data from Amazon, so when people buy food products that are unsafe, we mine that data and look at, we specifically created an AI system that could detect unsafe food products using that. Well, the idea was that if we can detect unsafe food products sooner, then the FDA can take actions instead of waiting for weeks and weeks after a lot of people have been affected. Another good example is mobile phone data. So specifically during the pandemic, there was a lot of conversation around how different people were responding to social distancing policies. And we wanted to look at whether there was any association with socioeconomic factors. So were there people that were responding a lot more because they could actually respond? So for example, some people were already staying at home before you even had social distancing policies in some regions me, for example. And so we, we wanted to see if the socioeconomic factors were a, a strong predictor of this. And so we looked at different neighbors in the US. So we got millions of uh, mobile phone records or mobile phone information. So this is de-identified information where we could tell where individuals were located in different neighborhoods in the US. And then we looked at whether individuals were moving around in different time periods at the beginning of the pandemic. And what we saw was that if you look at higher income neighborhoods, those individuals were already social distancing before we even had social distancing policy in place. While lower income neighborhoods, those individuals could not really, um, most of the individuals were not social distancing because a lot of them were in essential jobs. So they actually had to be working during that time. So they were more likely to be exposed and also more likely to get COVID. One last example I want to mention, this is around uh, social determinants of health. So we've been looking at remote sensing and place data to try to understand how we can better capture data on social determinants of health. So for social determinants of health are the conditions um, in which we live, play, work. So these are the factors that affect our daily lives. We collected about 150,000 satellite images from Google. 
And the goal was to try to test if, by just looking at those images for different neighborhoods, we could capture indicators of those neighborhoods in terms of access, what do people have access to, and could that predict health outcomes. So we looked at obesity specifically, and we use AI to process the images to extract indicators. This is work that has been done in the past, but in, what has been done in the past is that individuals, well, researchers will look at specific indicators. So they will look at the presence of fast food restaurants, for example, or the presence of green space, or the presence of uh, specific other types of indicators that have been associated with health. And so we wanted to create a, a, a comprehensive indicator of each neighborhood and then use that to predict health outcomes. And we did this for obesity, and it did quite well, so well that there were a lot of ridiculous news stories about how you could predict um, how, how fat different people were in the neighborhoods from space. Um, a lot of, some of them were quite offensive, but basically the goal of the project was to see if we could use AI to create more comprehensive indicators of neighborhoods so that individuals can use these to study what Different, different individuals in different types of neighborhoods are exposed to you and how that can impact their health outcomes. So what my work is currently focused on is to use AI, as I mentioned, to improve measurements of structural determinants of health, to look at historical policies and structural mechanisms and how those continue to influence presented health outcomes and to study and propose policies that can transform systems and structures to improve health outcomes for everyone. So just to give you an example about what we're doing around historical injustices or historical uh, policies. So one of the projects that I worked on during the pandemic is a racial data tracker. This is available online. And the goal of the racial data tracker was to collect, analyze, and disseminate data on racial disparities that points to the structural nature of racism. And by doing this, we want to be able to link this back to policies that we can then study and propose policy pro correctives so that we can actually create change in communities in the US. So we're doing, uh, the project is focused on using visualization, narrative, um, making data more easily downloadable for everyday people, for advocates, for policymakers, and others who are interested in using this kind of data for change. One research project, um, just to give an example of, of the research that is coming out of this, is a redlining project that we did to basically look at, I don't know how many people know about redlining in, in the audience, I see a few hands. Um, so during the 1930s, the, the US government created color-coded maps to de delineate areas that were deemed risky for investment based on very overtly racist criteria. So those were the four different criteria that are listed there. So A and B were mostly for affluent and predominantly white neighborhoods, while C and D were mostly for predominantly members of racial and ethnic minority groups. So in some cities, you could not see a single black person living in a neighborhood that was not classified as D. And there's been a lot of research today that shows that these policies continue to impact health disparities, including things like preterm births, asthma, and mortality. And this is kind of how the data looks like. So if you look at the different cities that were included, I think there were about 200 cities that were included across the, the US, and those were the four different criteria, as I just mentioned. So we worked with a colleague from the University of Maryland, uh, Queen Gwen. She had, she had processed about 164 million street view images to, to extract information on these diff different aspects of neighborhoods. So things like the presence of crosswalks, the presence of green space, the presence of cars, and what kinds of cars, and so forth. And we took this information and looked at how this information related to different temp topographical information. So we looked at structures of neighborhoods, specifically how different racial and ethnic groups were present in different neighborhoods, and then also looked at those um, government codings, so the HLSC codings from A to D, and how those related to present day uh, distribution of resources. So the first question we, we wanted to answer was, whether there were disparities in both environment resources when we looked at race, race and ethnic compositions of neighborhoods. And the second question or the second goal was to quantify how the built environment mediates the association between 
neighborhood racial composition and specific health outcomes. And so the first step that we, we took was to classify those different neighborhoods based on data. So we have predominantly white, predominantly black, predominantly minoritized, other racial groups other than white, and then we had unclassified neighborhoods. And this is what our data looked like. We had about 59 census tracts. So census tracts have on average about 3,000 people. And these are the, the built environment resources we're interested in, things like dilapidated buildings, green spaces. Green spaces have been studied quite a lot. The other ones on the, on the list have not been studied very much. So we looked at crosswalks, non-single family homes, and single lane roads. So our major findings were that if we looked at those 59,000 census tracts compared with other neighborhoods, predominantly in white neighborhoods, still had better access to resources that have been shown to encourage health. So things like green spaces, um, but also fewer of those resources that have been shown to promote poor health. So things like dilapidated buildings. And then when you moved at the gradings from A to D, the gradings I showed you before, the, the conditions of the neighborhood got worse. So if you compare the resources in neighborhoods that were graded A to resources that were in neighborhoods that were graded D, there were significant differences between what they had access to, especially for resources that tend to promote health. We also noted that the most significant mediator in our model, so when we looked at health outcomes and racial composition of neighborhoods was non-single family homes. So what this basically told us was that the type and quality of home is quite important, especially for the, the health outcomes that we're looking at, sleep quality and asthma. So why does this matter? This is the question I get all the time. It's very important because nothing that's happening today is just happening now. A lot of what we experience today has been shaped by history. So historical policies continue to impact our lives today. If we don't measure things, they can change. And sometimes we have to measure things over and over and over again. And if you ever work in advocacy, you have to see the same thing over and over and over again before change can happen. And Policies created as disparities, and I believe that policies can also be used to, to correct this dispar disparities. So what kinds of policies do we need, and can we create those policies so we can create change for different populations? And I just want to end by saying that data and algorithms can be used to create a more equitable or inequitable world, and we all have the power to do that. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you so much. So opening the floor to questions again and uh, you'll remember the protocol for entering your questions right on the screen. So excellent, we have some great questions coming in already. So I can start with the first one. Um, so this one was triggered by your comment on the satellite uh, measuring obesity or predicting obesity from space. So the question really is broader though. It's, it's how do you uncouple causation from correlation? triggered by that thought? Yeah, that's a very good question and one that comes up quite a lot. It's, it's actually quite challenging in this space of research to do causal research. We have done, um, developed some models where we try to create causality, but it's actually quite challenging to show causality in some of these cases because there are so many different factors that contribute to the outcomes that we see. And the thing about disparities or uh, systems that impact disparities that we see is that systems tend to overlay on top of each other. So when you think about things like, let's say for me as a black woman, there are so many different factors that I have to deal with. So there, is, there are factors around sexism and racism and sometimes ageism based on how, people th how old people think I am. And so those different factors can impact my health in different ways. So uncoupling those different factors and actually linking them to a single one is quite challenging, but it's something that we're thinking about in the work that we're doing. Fantastic, thank you. So another question uh, has to do with single family homes in particular, and why that might imply uh, fewer environmental exposures. So just thinking about condos and different modalities that might not be single family homes. So if you could just reflect on that one. Yeah, so single family homes in this particular case were 
quite important, I think because individuals are not typically exposed to the same things that you have in apartment buildings, for example. So those might, those in some cases can be very noisy, which can affect sleep quality. But in other cases, in the types of buildings that we were capturing in this data, where you have things like dilapidated buildings that have been associated with things like asthma. Um, so in those neighborhoods, you also not, you don't only have the fact that you don't have single family homes, but you also have homes that people should not be living in in the first place. Fantastic. So another question uh, pertains to your earlier framing with the great work happening in Africa. And if you could maybe reflect on what are some of the key projects you're sort of most excited about and engaged with uh, on the African continent. There's so many, so many, many, many exciting projects. Um, th there's a lot of work going on around developing data sets for African languages. Uh, that's one that there's a, a lot of funding that has been coming to that. A large community of individuals are working on that. There are lots of startups that are coming out of that space. There's also a lot of work around disease detection and um, Specifically, how do you use AI in medical settings to improve how diseases are detected or diagnosed? So there's a, the, there's a lot of work around that space as well. And then there's, there's also work just around education. So how do we use AI to develop better educational tools, especially in rural settings where there might not be enough resources for different individuals who are interested in learning about health? Fantastic. So here's another one. Thinking about how we go to from sort of research and innovation to impact. So the question is, are there organizations outside of academia that you engage with actively to reduce inequality and sort of mobilize your discoveries? In the past, it's mostly been local departments of health. So working with local departments of health to develop tools that they can use. Currently, I'm having more conversations with individuals who are activists and working in this space and how we can better do research that they can then use. So instead of just doing research that is not easy for them to translate in something that can be used to create change, how can we do research and produce research in a way that can be useful for them in the long term? Terrific. So maybe we'll have just a couple more questions here. So uh, one has to do with representation in data sets, which I think is something you, you highlighted earlier on. So if there's particular groups, for example, African populations that are, have lower representation in particular kinds of data sets, how would we best address this moving forward? I think one way is creating more data. And I think that's work that's already been done, but I think is work that definitely needs a lot more investment because there are researchers who are interested in creating data sets to be used in AI models, but they do need the resources to be able to create that data. Another one is around incentives. Um, I've heard stories of people who've created data sets and then you have the big tech companies come in and take that data and use it to train their models without giving them any kind of compensation or even acknowledging the work. And in some cases coming back to them and then asking them to apply for grants so then they can consider funding them, which is insulting because they already used the data. So you know I can do the work, you've already seen the work I've produced, and now you're asking me to come in and apply so then you can evaluate whether I am um, qualified to get funding to do this work. And so I, I think there's that imbalance in terms of power. A lot of the power and privilege exists in the global north, and the global south is not always given that power and not always given that seat at the table. And I think there are opportunities for us to do better. Fantastic. So we'll close with one more question, and I'll note there's lots more interest and lots more opportunity for discussion. But the question is, what are some effective interventions, or maybe you could frame one that you think is particularly impactful, to reduce health disparities? That's a very big question. <laughs> um, I can think of one example that, that was very contextualized, and I heard someone else, there was, there was an, this was another presentation, and I really liked it. So they were trying to develop an app to prevent cardiovascular disease 
in African American men in the US. And the way the researcher went about it was engaging with these communities from the beginning. So instead of just creating an app and then expecting them to use them, they had conversations with them from the beginning by asking them, what, what would you like an app to look like? What is the kind of app that you would use on a daily basis? Um, and then they got into the design process, gave them ideas of the kinds of things that they would like to see in an app. The app was developed, brought back to them again, and they evaluated it, gave it feedback, and it was improved. And they actually used that app. And so I think that's one way of going about reducing health disparities instead of just creating solutions that we think will work and then expecting different populations that are being impacted by health disparities to use those solutions. Co-creating those solutions with them, I think, will have a significant impact in reducing health disparities. Fantastic. So again, lots more interest in further discussion, and folks can find you at uh, subsequent moments in the program. But for now, let's all thank uh, Dr. Elaine and Tbilisi for a great talk. Hello, I wanted to follow, follow up Demis's incredible talk by thinking more about what will or what do AI, AI breakthroughs in science really look like? And we think that AlphaFold really has been a revolution in a certain area of science. And what does it really mean in practice? What do we do faster? What do we not do faster? How can we think about these new technologies that we're going to develop? How are they going to empower scientists in detail? And want to look at it from the point of view of something that in a certain sense is very narrow, AlphaFold, that it implements, it turns the left into the right. It's something that takes a protein sequence, it runs a series of computational steps, and ends up with a protein structure. And in fact, protein structures are rare, but not extremely rare. After all, we were able to train a deep learning system, right, that there's about 200,000 known structures. So what does kind of abundance of the right mean? for science, how are people using this? And I think it's important as we think about it to say also that AlphaFold really produces two things and I should really update this slide. It doesn't just produce an answer, but it produces really calibrated belief in the correctness of this answer and of different parts of the answer. And in fact, a lot of the work that went into both the database that went into the paper and really went into the systems that we actually use is that these models can know when they're right. In fact, that you really can, we're not totally trapped by the notions of um, you know, hallucination, which have been very, very challenging within language models. But with AlphaFold, typically, the answer will be right or it will re be reported as uncertain. And in fact, we even report multiple measures of uncertainty because an answer itself, a protein structure, isn't just right or wrong, but it's going to be used by scientists who are going to look at these structures, develop hypotheses, and then do experiments based on those hypotheses. And within a protein structure, there are many, many things that you can learn from it. And you need to know for each of those facts whether the model is reporting that confidently or hesitantly. And we have, though, been successful that this seems to really, really work, that these confidences really do give not a perfect, but a very, very useful indication of when you should believe such a result. And so because of that, this process that we're doing of, in essence, amplifying experimental data, right, taking sparse gathered experimental data, each with its own particular purpose, uh, schematically represented on the left, and turning it into this enormous abundance of data, does it in some sort of reliable way that we can then use as the basis of further science. But I think it's really, really important to say that on the right side are not drugs that treat specific conditions. They're a particular piece of scientific information, protein structures. How are they integrated into the wider processes by which we ultimately understand biology, develop drugs, and ultimately help patients? And so I think it's really interesting to look at a couple case studies. And I should say that all of these are external work. And I'm very proud to say that we had nothing to do with them, that our system is so useful that uh, that people do really impactful science that lands in very high tiered journals, and then we read about it at the same time as everyone else. And uh, one of the first uh, kind of things that we noticed is that when we had trained AlphaFold, it was always much easier to predict small proteins, not something as large as, for example, the left, the structure of the nuclear pore, so hundreds and hundreds of protein chains far beyond 
what AlphaFold can do. And we thought maybe, okay, that's, uh, that's going to be in the future work section of our paper. But uh, it turned out to be the, the present due to the clever work of Jan Kaczynski, Martin Beck, and a number of other uh, scientists who said, well, actually, let's just couple AlphaFold with other data that we have experimentally, in this case, cryo-electron tomography, which produces extremely relevant in situ images of important parts, in this case, the nuclear pore, which controls uh, what can go in and out of the nucleus. Now, that provides very low resolution imagery, but we can figure out uh, where in, the, in that image what kind of regions correspond to the shapes of proteins that AlphaFold has found. And so we can, in essence, take a model that is very low resolution, 15 angstroms for the specialists in the audience, and we can convert that into a near atomic model. And we're really doing two things as we do this. We're bringing much, much more utility to the cryo-electron tomography data. You can understand better the detailed molecular interactions that make the nuclear pore that control its function, but you're also simultaneously validating the alpha fold structures, that they agree or don't agree uh, with these densities, or the predicted interactions agree or don't agree. And so what we're finding is that there's quite a lot of hybrid work where it enables new types of structure determination and understanding of large cellular complexes and resolving a lot of the paradoxes in experimental data so that we can come to detailed conclusions, so that we can understand these big machines that make up the cell. But okay, that's still kind of structured determination. It's clearly within uh, AlphaFold's wheelhouse. Um, but we've started to see maybe even more interesting types of uses. In this case, um, take a protein that was known to be involved in uh, replication in uh, vertebrates. Uh, Donson, but whose function wasn't really understood. And you can see the prediction in the AlphaFold database. I don't think I have a laser here, but you can see it in the top left in subpanel A. And, you, and a lot of the interesting uh, biology is actually in the disordered loop, the little uh, piece of spaghetti that's wrapping around uh, the ordered bit of the structure. So you might say, well, the AlphaFold database didn't have much to say about this protein, but we also have AlphaFold multimer, which predicts protein-protein interactions. And the scientist said, well, we know about 70 uh, proteins involved in DNA replication that maybe interact with this protein. So they simply ran AlphaFold using that speed that Demis mentioned, ran AlphaFold multimer against all of these proteins and found a number of very specific interactions with parts of Donson that you can see in panels B through F that were all attaching to different parts of Donson. In fact, could put this together into a unified model of this interaction complex that Donson scaffolds, and in fact could confirm all this, and the important thing is you can say, well, this is just hypothesis, but they could confirm it with relatively direct uh, biochemical experiments, right, a molecular gel on the, on the bottom right. And so in a certain sense, in fact, what is being confirmed here is not the structures. Certainly you can't pull a structure out of the ink blots on the bottom right, but what's being confirmed is that the interesting things that are found agree with experiment, which gives us confidence in the prediction, gives us models. In fact, uh, there was parallel uh, structure determination work that confirmed a large number of details in a separate study. And then this is giving us more confidence, in fact, and the, the authors went back and explored and said, well, what if we didn't even know these 70 proteins? What if we scanned against the whole 20,000 human uh, protein coding repertoire, and in fact, with a little bit of work and a little bit of intervention, we're able to pull very similar findings and say that we're really at the moment at which, even though we built the system for structure determination, that it can be really, really useful in finding new interactions, new components, in a sense, new questions that we should be understanding. And it's all kind of driven in a way that certainly was not in our expertise, but also was not in our intention. It wasn't part of the PDB, doesn't have interaction discovery. But when you don't train really powerful deep learning systems, um, Ken called them foundation models, they start to learn, really, they start to get aligned with the underlying problem, to learn something about the physics, the biology, the evolution that is useful in many, many contexts, and in this case, without even fine tuning or retraining. Now, that's kind of interesting, but can we go even more in the reverse? And I think this has been a very exciting kind of area of research empowered by uh, the AlphaFold database. In this case uh, is another cryo-electron tomography image 
uh, a density of protein material from uh, sperm, I think this is actually from mouse, uh, within the flagellum. So trying to understand how uh, mobility uh, is controlled at a molecular level uh, for sperm. And there were a number of proteins that were simply not known. And this is, for example, the blue. This is, in essence, what people knew. There is something that, something that looks like this, that looks like maybe multiple proteins in a line. And they said, well, how are we going to figure out what this protein is? Well, we have AlphaFold database. So they simply scanned the entire mouse proteome and said, which proteins fit in that shape? And so they, in fact, found a couple, I believe, tech proteins uh, that fit nicely within this density, that the AlphaFold predicted structure was concordant with this, but how did they know that they're right? And so they said, well, then that induces certain hypotheses that if we look at, I believe it was mass spec, or sorry, mass spectrometry or protein identification in extracts, um, in different cellular extracts, then they found these proteins upregulated in a way concordant with AlphaFold. So this gives us kind of belief that we've in fact gone from shape, gone from some unknown, there's something here and it looks about like this, to finding exactly what that is because we have this complete repertoire of mouse protein uh, structures. And so we're seeing kind of new types of discovery that as we take higher and higher resolution pictures of the cell through techniques like cryoelectron tomography, we can use the bottom-up knowledge uh, from AlphaFold in order to generate really, really interesting hypotheses and then confirm those hypotheses. And this is a fact throughout kind of science that if you have very specific hypotheses, you can often come up with much, much easier ways to confirm those hypotheses than if you have a large set of uh, hypotheses to choose from. So we're really seeing now uh, running AlphaFold in reverse because of AlphaFold database from shape to protein. We're also seeing really another case in which, and this is a study of midnalin. This was a protein that was almost unstudied uh, before this paper came out. Um, and it was discovered to have an important role in degrading certain classes of proteins. I believe it's the intermediate early genes that are involved in the cell cycle. And since it was pretty much unstudied, of course, no one had taken the year or more to uh, determine its structure. And the authors had run AlphaFold and found, and sorry, and so somehow it recognizes hundreds of proteins and drags them off to uh, the proteasome to be chewed up and discarded. After all, you know, as the cell has many cycles, sometimes it wants a protein and then doesn't want a protein. So uh, this is one of the mechanisms by which it gets rid of it. And they found, if they upregulated this partic particular protein, midnalin, that there were hundreds of genes, I think they found about 500, whose, um, whose abundance was strongly decreased by upregulating midnalin. And they said, maybe, maybe this is degraded, but maybe there are many other causes. So they took all 500 of these proteins, and they put them through alpha-fold multimer together with midnalin. And what they found for 200 of them is that the, the exact same type of thing happened. So uh, IRF4 beta is a particular protein that is uh, regulated by midnalin. And they found that if they folded them together with alpha-fold multimer, that this particular, a small bit of IR, IRF4 beta is trapped between two different parts of midnalin. So catch two and catch one are both parts of midnalin. And that together forms the superstructure where you can see the five strands uh, together. And that suggests that maybe actually what midnalin is doing is it's recognizing proteins by whether or not they can complete these catch domains. And uh, so they then go and do just the really obvious experiments. Well, what happens if I get rid of that little small section of uh, four beta? And of course, that dramatically reduces or eliminates the amount by which this protein is degraded in the cell. So that strongly suggests, in fact, this is recognized. Of the 200 hits that they had, they tried, I think, 10 of them at random. And in every one, deleting that little region uh, that, al that AlphaFold Multimer was predicting was binding between the catch domains would abolish um, the degradation of these proteins. So we have a really, really strong signal, both that this structural model of recognition is right, we have information that we can use to think about how mutations might affect that recognition. And we have really now a belief that we understand much, much more about the biology. And I think that it was already a very high quality paper without the AlphaFold results. But we would simply say Mindelin is important. Somehow it knocks these proteins down. 
Uh, but because of AlphaFold, we get to skip two or three steps and say, well, it does it just like this. And this is how mutations in midline or mutations of these proteins might affect. There was actually one really beautiful case where eliminating one of these strands didn't actually uh, reduce the uh, degradation of this protein, but did not eliminate it. But then they found that AlphaFold multimer models predicted binding of midline in two different places. And so eliminating both of those sites uh, did abolish the degradation. And so we're really getting at the point at which we can convert, in a sense, biochemical orthogonal insights into structural insights and skip steps. And I think we should start to think of this, and we'll see this more, that we're skipping steps in the process, and then we can confirm the hypotheses that we've developed based on this, that each of these induce really, really specific hypotheses that we can understand, that we can think about, that we can test, and we're making science a bit faster. We're making some science tremendously faster, but overall we're making science a bit faster, and we'll keep just seeing this snowball. Another really beautiful case of this um, was some protein engineering done by the Jang Lab at MIT, and this is a particularly interesting protein called the contractile inject injection system that, um, I can't remember the system in which it does it, but it in essence injects proteins into cells, and somehow the feet of this protein that looks a little bit like a lunar lander or a rocket, the, the feet of the rocket uh, recognize specific cell types before injecting. And this was in, I think, a, a plant pathogen system or something else. And people wanted to say, well, can this work in mammalian, in, uh, mammalian cells? How can we retarget this? How can we turn this from a oddity of biology into a really powerful system of biotechnology, much like CRISPR was converted from, oh, that's an interesting bacterial immune system to one of the most important technologies in uh, manipulating cells and manipulating our genome. And they found, uh, after about 100 experiments, they said they were unable to figure out how to modify this protein, even which parts of it should they modify, because they didn't have a structure. The structure was drawn later. Which parts of this should we modify in order to retarget this. And then they looked at uh, AlphaFold predictions and almost immediately said, oh, well, that region at the bottom must be the feet, and I bet I can replace exactly this with a uh, design protein, a DARPIN, in order to, to target. And they did that and almost immediately produced a system that they could target to arbitrary cell types and deliver uh, drugs, including Cas9, for gene therapy, and they demonstrated this um, in mice where they were able to do targeted delivery into a certain, um, I believe, cell in the mouse brain. And you can see it because they um, delivered a uh, fluorescent protein and are able to verify that they did in fact, or delivered, uh, I think did gene editing to deliver a fluorescent protein. And so we're really starting to see this is a new mechanism of protein engineering. And I think again, it's something in which it's incredible that AlphaFold was able to play a part, that really the author said it was a very important at unlocking a key step and also use their creativity, that it's not, you know, AlphaFold delivers drugs, it's that AlphaFold enables the creativity of others to deliver drugs, that accelerates these key steps of science, that helps us also move from, instead of saying, well, let us find someone else who can finally do structure determination and then we can continue, let's us skip that step. Now, I think there's some lessons here in general about what will AI-driven kind of scientific revolutions really look like. And I think one answer is almost certainly we're going to get dramatically better at some problems, orders and orders of magnitude better at some problems. And when you get orders and orders of magnitude better and faster at certain problems, you find new ways to use that hammer, right? And so people are going to be incredibly diverse and creative, and we're seeing this across what, what I think is really the foundation model phenomenon, is that if you can train one really, really powerful model that really understands a system or a question, then you can use it in many ways. I think we will experimentally confirm not the predictions themselves in most cases. We'll confirm uh, really the hypotheses that people have from them. And scientists always work with incomplete data. They always work from hypothesis. Ask any scientist, do you trust every paper in the literature? And they'll laugh a little if the, before they answer. And so really, scientists are used to dealing with uncertainty, but we confirm ultimately what we wanted to learn after looking at the structure. Computational and AI science is really good when it leads scientists to make better experiments, to more efficiently use their time. 
I think, and maybe I'll, I'll step out a little bit on a limb here, that trust in these systems will come from them being able to predict their uncertainty from really good confidence measures, not actually interpretability. You don't need interpretability. You don't need to perfectly understand everything. We don't need a grand unified uh, theory of uh, physics in order to do proper engineering. What we really need is to know when we know and when we don't. And sometimes we develop those intuitions as humans. And sometimes we are aided by reports of uncertainty such as we provide from AlphaFold. And I think this will be very, very important and will let us use the most state-of-the-art models, but will force us to think really carefully about how do we accurately measure our uncertainty? How are those durable across different uh, usages? How do we think about them in different contexts, et cetera? I think also we will see science and medicine will be driven by the areas that are really very compatible with AI discovery. And I think kind of cellular biology is one of those wonderful areas in which there's a lot of really interesting data. There's a lot of different related systems that have an underlying um, physical basis. And I think this will drive a lot of the improvements in health because we will be better able to understand biology. We will do drug discovery. Our, tr our clinical trials will ultimately succeed more often because we understand biology better, right? Ignorance makes it very, very hard for us to do really great drug discovery. And I think the progress will be uneven because some things will be better suited to AI algorithms and we will lean into those areas and we will find ways to leverage the places where the data is on our side and try and step around the problems where it isn't as best we can. And so this will change the nature of how scientists work in different fields where these AI-driven advancements occur. Now, there we go. Finally, I think I want to just say cells are complicated. Right, so this is uh, artist rendition of the JCVI minimal cell, right? And it's not so minimal. I think it's 473 genes. Cells are really, really complex. And it's extraordinarily hard to study any tiny subpart of this image. You know, many great, uh, many great careers, I believe many uh, worthy Gardner Prize winners have studied a tiny amount of a tiny part of biology. And we will have, oh, geez. Well, we will have the tools we need to understand them, but we will have to build them and it will have to be a conversation between uh, experiment and computation. Thank you. Fantastic. So totally inspiring talks. Thank you, Demi, for coming back up. And we have lots of questions, and I will keep an eye on our fearless leader at the front, who's going to give me signals of <laughs> how best to navigate, given the level of interest uh, and the timeline in our program. But brilliant, you know, brilliant work, and thank you. So uh, lots of different questions. I'm going to go through some different ones. So we've clearly got some structural people in the audience here. So I'll put out a few questions, and uh, you can answer them not at a super deeply technical level, maybe, but uh, to keep the, the, I'll the talk general. I'll later. <laughs> yes, exactly. So first question that lots of interest uh, was, was supporting was, um, how does AlphaFold deal with protein flexibility, dynamics, changes in conformation, et cetera? So this is kind of, so for, uh, actually, I will, I will tell the story. You know, I, I used to work more directly in protein dynamics, and I, I do remember telling my boss, Tobin, you know, if, if he believes that, you know, proteins are points or static rigid objects, I'm not sure we can be friends. Of course he didn't. But um, so proteins move, and yet we have to stop them from moving to take their picture. And so what we do find, actually, what a lot of scientists have found is a lot of correlates of the protein dynamics in AlphaFold, both the more mobile regions have much lower confidence as expected. How can you know where they're going to be if they're moving? Um, we also see new methods being developed that basically change the inputs to AlphaFold without retraining that start to capture the kind of landscape of multiple modes. And I think this is an area in which it's really probing how much does AlphaFold understand not just like what will appear in a crystal, but how much does it understand protein physics? And I think the answer is becoming clear that it understands a fair amount and that it's able to drive multiple states, but we have to figure out how to induce those states, and it's something that I hope will get better over time. But yeah, proteins move, and I think people are starting to understand how that motion might be captured in AlphaFold. Fantastic. Thank you. So we'll stay on the, the general theme here uh, and ask maybe a question about 
post-translational modification. How do we think about that? Is it integrated? What do we do? So there's been, I guess I'll quickly go, I mean, there's been some really interesting studies of both cofactors and, um, so this is different things. After the protein is made, it gets changed. Uh, because the protein's made of atoms, the cell likes to do lots of chemistry on atoms, so there's lots of changes to proteins. What we do find in some cases is that the alpha fold structure obviously only reports the structure of the canonical amino acids in a protein, but will often leave space for the post-translational modifications, uh, or especially uh, cofactors like heme. But we don't really have a way to say, well, how is the structure going to be different if I have a post-translational modification, or how is the phosphorylated form different than the non-phosphorylated? And that has to be a subject of future research. Can I just uh, give a general, more general answer to both those questions? So, the, obviously, with AlphaFold, we've kind of um, dealt with the static picture, as John was saying, of, of proteins. But of course, in biology, it's it's a hugely dynamical system. So you can think of what we're trying to do next in both uh, both at, at Google DeepMind and also isomorphic is go up that interaction stack. So first of all, pairwise interactions, proteins and proteins, proteins with ligands, proteins with nucleic acids. I think we're making great progress with that. Then eventually, you might, might imagine modeling a whole pathway, maybe like the Tor pathway. And then eventually, that's how we can maybe build up to something like a virtual cell, like uh, John flashed up at the end, uh, which of course would, you know, in a hugely complex interactive system. But I think over the next maybe decade, I think we can get there. Fantastic, thank you. So maybe building on these questions and taking it a little forward looking, uh, this question asks whether AlphaFold can predict structures that don't exist. And I think one of the earlier slides highlighted sort of building new enzymes with new functionalities. So maybe you could reflect on, on that. So what we have found, first of all, is that uh, AlphaFold has been quite important. Uh, some the ideas inspired, but also the system itself in designed proteins, and there's been a real revolution in protein design in the past uh, two years. One of the most interesting kind of facts is that when people have designed proteins, they found trying to predict such structure with alpha fold and seeing whether they got the answer they expected is extraordinarily powerful at figuring out which of their designs are real. And so they, uh, there have been reports of 10 times higher success rates in protein design by screening through AlphaFold. So pretty much no uh, design proteins get made anymore that AlphaFold doesn't like. So it has turned out to be very useful in the verification step of designing new proteins. And I think we'll see more developments of the ideas and technologies that will continue this protein design revolution that we're in. I think it's pretty interesting to um, also think about the reverse of, I mean, people in protein design are using this, the reverse of AlphaFold, which is sort of, you know, here's a structure you would like, what is the amino acid sequence that would create that structure? Uh, and I think that's, you know, it uh, clearly works and will work uh, even better. I think the missing part of what we have for protein design is to go from, um, from, from function to structure, like what structure should you specify in for the function that you're looking for? So that's actually the part that needs to be solved in my opinion. I think it's pretty, you know, easy-ish now to go from a structure to um, uh, the, the sequence uh, by doing the reverse, uh, you know, alpha fold in reverse effectively. Terrific. So we're now getting two more questions. <laughs> so we are going to take a big leap into a slightly different space. Uh, and there was a question that just highlighted the remarkable innovation at a really early age. And as we're at this sort of moment of transformation and how we compute and think about the world, maybe you could reflect on how do we make sure we're supporting the next generation? So we're going to shift gears here and think about how do we support you know, youth? How do we support this sort of transformation and how we think about the world around us. Yeah, well, I mean, it depends on what um, what age we're talking about, right? So if we're talking about the kind of um, undergraduate level, you know, going thinking about grad school, I, I would say what we need a lot more of, and I've been trying to encourage philanthropists to do this, and, and my own uh, found sort of um, philanthropy is to, is to encourage multidisciplinary work. Right, so uh, grants for multidisciplinary PhDs, uh, combining different fields together, I mean, obviously including machine learning, but actually getting expert in the other domain. And I think that was what was critical for AlphaFold actually was bringing together uh, world-class sort of machine learning people and engineering, but also people who knew structural biology, such as John and, and chemistry uh, and also biophysics. So in the end, I think we needed uh, an incredibly multidisciplinary talented team to crack something uh, like AlphaFold. Um, and I think that's going to be more important in future uh, when thinking about where to apply AI. Fantastic. Thank you. 
And so maybe as a, did you want to jump in oh, on that, John? I just wanted yeah. to say also that it's actually the easiest time for young people to get involved, that a lot of these tools that we're thinking of are, are available. You're not just the AlphaFold database, but AlphaFold Multimer and others. So it's a golden age to try and really work with the same tools as specialists because computation has gotten powerful, because you don't need both the incredible investment and the safety protocols needed to work in a lab. So it's an incredible time, I think, for young people to play with the same kind of questions that working scientists are. Fantastic, thank you so much. So maybe we'll close on a last question that just kind of highlights clearly remarkable power and promise of the technology. And, and I think you highlighted the importance of responsible AI and these discussions are obviously incredibly timely. So just curious if you could reflect on sort of how you think we need to be moving forward in a thoughtful way to ensure the kinds of amazing platforms you're building are uh, utilized in an ethical way. Well, look, I mean, there's many components to, 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 to answering that, and we're still finding our way as a field. But I think the obvious ones are to involve uh, many, many different inputs and voices into the designs of these systems, and, uh, and, and especially uh, the communities that these systems might affect. Um, I think we need much better testing and evaluation protocols, so benchmarks for uh, testing these learning systems, which are pretty complex. Uh, and in a lot of cases, they're kind of black box-like, but they don't need to be. They, they, I think we could understand these systems a lot better, and um, we need a lot more work on analysis and research on analysis techniques and methods. So I think that's coming, something we're pushing a lot uh, forward, and we just announced today a, a fund, a safety fund, with some of the other leading labs to give grants to academia and others uh, who want to research these questions. Um, so I think there's a lot of work on that. Um, but then, you know, it also goes into societal questions about how do we want to um, uh, 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 control sort of access to these systems and you know we're big fans of open source science and open science of course that's the way things progress but one also has to think about bad actors uh, getting hold of these systems and repurposing them for, for, for bad ends so um, they are general purpose technology so how do we enable the, all the good use cases but uh, restrict and, and mitigate against uh, against the bad use cases and the risks um, uh, and so there's lots of huge questions. And in fact, next week in, in the UK, there's a convening of uh, an AI safety summit, an international AI safety summit with many of the leading uh, uh, technologists and also heads of government are gonna be there to discuss exactly these questions. And I think it's great as a first step uh, towards international dialogue on these points. Fantastic, well, please join me in thanking again, Demis Savas and John Jumper. And over to Janet. Oh, it was so exciting. I forgot I had to finish the session. So thanks, Leah. And uh, thanks, Demis and John and everyone else, all the other speakers uh, and all of you. Great questions from the audience. And I hope you had a great time. We have not finished Gardner Science Week. And I want to invite you all back tomorrow morning in the same place. 8.30 this time, so you'll have to get up a little earlier for the Laureate Lectures, where we'll hear from all of this year's Gerd, uh, Canada Gairdner awardees of their life story to the point of re receiving the award and the impact of the uh, uh, research that they've done on many different aspects. So thank you, and we'll see you tomorrow.